Okay. It's been wonderful family time. And, uh, I got to get my garden plow up. I drive an old 8M Ford tractor, 1914 Ford tractor, like Green Acres. Um, so I'm hoping I get some good vegetables well, this year. I think we were here. Well, seeing as we should know when February is when we usually get our freezes, and so I'll not plant for a little bit longer, yeah. but I got, I got an old plow up. I know. I hope we don't get one, but... Okay. So are you ready? Yes, sir. How you doing? Thank you. Mean as a snake. Happy New Year to you, sir. Morning, sir. Happy New Year. Hello, JJ Watt. Yeah. I but you have good other stuff, of course. Not just a bike ride. No, it's great. What was he? Because I called him. He did well. All right. Good morning. It is 10 a.m. New decade. I'd like to call the January 7, 2020 meeting of Commissioner's Court to order. Commissioner Cagle. Uh, Your Honor, this morning we were supposed to have one minister come and talk to us that we had rescheduled to today to uh, make an opportunity for the pastor for uh, Deputy Dollawall. But somehow or another, they haven't made the building. But it just so happens that we are honoring uh, in our resolutions uh, Dr. Pastor Reverend Lawrence White uh, and his work in the community. And so with your permission, Your Honor, I would like to call him forward to, uh, to open us up in our, in our opening prayer since he is here and available. And I understand from his wife that he is capable on the spot to come up with a prayer. <laughs> Great. Pastor White, welcome. Let us pray. We begin, as always, in the name of our God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we pray at your command and in response to your promise that you will hear your people in prayer. And we ask that you would be present among us today, that you would enable this branch of government to be what you designed government to be, the defender of justice, the protector of the weak, of the homeless, of the helpless, of the innocent unborn, and those who cannot stand or speak for themselves. We ask that you might give wisdom and judgment to these leaders whom you have chosen, that all that is done may be done in a way which strengthens this community and draws us closer together with one another, that with one voice we in this great city of Houston may live together in peace and harmony glorify you now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a few resolutions this morning. Let's start with Precinct 4, Commissioner Cable. Well, Your Honor, we have a resolution this morning uh, recognizing 
uh, the work of Dr. Lawrence White. And uh, whereas Dr. Lawrence White served as the senior pastor of our Savior Lutheran Church in Houston, which serves both Precinct 4 and Precinct 1 uh, significantly in that area, uh, their church and school have been located in, the, in their 46-acre campus, Northwest Houston, offering Houston families a traditional classical education that cultivates the minds and souls of children. And whereas Pastor White doesn't just minister to his growing congregation, but is a regular speaker all across America, addressing millions of Americans through national radio, television broadcasts, uh, and ministers to the ministers, the fellow pastors that are out there. He's distinguished a distinguished uh, and published author whose books have been translated into multiple languages. I'm still waiting for an autographed copy of your latest work, Pastor White, just letting you know. Cactus will send you one in Russian. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he is Thank one you. of the founders and current chairman of the Greater Houston Area Pastors Roundtable, which is dedicated to advocating uh, for uh, involvement of pastors in our our life. And so with that, Your Honor, I request that we resolve that we recognize Dr. Lawrence White for his dedicated service to the spiritual well-being of our community and for his uh, dedicated advocacy for the children in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Uh, and I move. I have a second. Would you like to make any comments? Well, I'll try and be brief since I've already gotten to speak somewhat, but... Uh, I thank you for this resolution, and uh, Cactus, at our classical school, we teach people not to read that quickly, <laughs> especially when it's about the preacher. But, uh, <laughs> I've been in Houston for 40 years, and uh, pastor of our Savior Lutheran Church, originally on uh, North Shepherd Drive, and we relocated 20 years ago to a now 60-acre campus on what we found out afterwards was uh, originally a dairy farm owned by one of the charter members who founded the church back in 1947. We are happy to be in this great city of Houston. When we relocated originally, we had considered the option of making a suburban shift like so many churches have done over the years. But we decided that this was our home and this where, was where we wanted our ministry to stay. And so uh, that's what we've done in our school with some 300 students, uh, reaches across ethnic and economic lines to provide the best education we possibly can. And so thank you for this honor. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Did you ever give squatty lines any problems? <laughs> I was always afraid of squatty lines. It's the little guys you got to watch. <laughs> and <laughs> I met Squatty shortly after getting here. I was told he was the man I had to know. So uh, we got to know him very well, and uh, it was a pleasure. It's a great family. Thank you. Sir. Thank you for your work. Commissioner, you had another resolution, I believe. Okay, Judge. I'm sorry. I, uh... National School Board. Yes, we do. Um, Your Honor, if I could have the, uh, the, the school board groups come stand over here. Uh, where's Paul? Paul today, Judge, is not working for Precinct 4. We took him off the clock. He, he today is, a, is a, a trustee, and he's working in that capacity. But we, uh, whereas Harris County, Texas, is comprised of 24 independent school districts, and each school district is led by a board of trustees that sets the clear vision and direction for the school district. And whereas the boards of trustees play an important role in the education of our community's children, by carefully choosing the superintendents, adopting and overseeing the annual budgets, adopting curricula, overseeing construction, and maintaining healthy school districts, and whereas the boards of trustees are responsible for the business of the school district while paying close attention and maintaining academic achievement in Harris County, our boards of trustees are visionaries who are fiscally responsible, excellent collaborators, wholly dedicated to the needs and success of our students. I'm trying to read with more emphasis to, to accommodate Pastor White. Uh, and whereas the members of the boards of trustees in Harris County are selfless leaders who play an integral part in the development of the next generation. Our trustees are interested and invited in the academic development of all the students in our community 
And now, therefore, be it resolved that the Harris County Commissioner's Court hereby proclaims January 2020 as National School Board Recognition Month for the dedicated service to the education and academic success of the students in our community. Uh, Mr. Shanklin. Good morning. Good morning, Judge Hidalgo. Good morning, Commissioner Ellis, Commissioner Garcia, Commissioner Raddick, and Commissioner Cagle. I'm Paul Shanklin. Most of you know me. Uh, in my free time, I'm blessed with the opportunity to serve the real important constituents of our county, and that's our children. And I would like to, and I'm the president of the board of the Aldine Independent School District, and I would like to introduce you to some real passionate people. First, the vice president of our board is Rose Avalos. Our, our secretary is Connie Esparza. Uh, we have with us Mr. Randy Bates, our newest member. He's a former president of the Lone Star Board. And Mr. Steve Mead, absent today uh, is Dr. Kimberly Booker and our superintendent, which is Dr. Latanya Gaffney. Lastly, I would like to introduce our dean of our school board, Dr. Viola Garcia. Dr. Garcia has served the school board since 1992. She has 26 years of experience and she has been recently named as a member of the board of the National Association of School Boards. And I'd like you just to acknowledge that. Uh, I'd like to take a brief moment because most of the time we're asked, what does a school board do? The main function of the school board is to provide local governments and oversight of education in our district. It is important to understand that though the ultimate responsibility for education is the state of Texas, Texas has delegated much of the authority to our local communities who elect their local members. Although we are elected, we are not paid. And as you see in front of you and with all the school boards in the state of Texas, we are passionate people to work for our community and we are passionate about public education. To give you a little bit of information about the Aldine School Board, and Judge, you represent all of us, and we would love to have you come and visit us sometime. Of course. Uh, the 94% of our schools met standard in 2018. We've got 66,668 students or young souls in our possession, 73% of which are Hispanic, 87.3% are economically uh, disadvantaged, 734 at risk, uh, and 34 points with limited language efficiency. The state of Texas has recognized Aldine for our work. We have 81 campuses, 111 square miles, 9,138 employees. We touch nearly every precinct in, precinct in, in Harris County. We have campuses in Precinct 1, Precinct 2, and Precinct 4. Commissioner Ellis, in our community, you are a living legend. Uh, we haven't seen you in the fofo in a while. <laughs> we would love for you to come and visit, and I understand that at one point in time, there was a little competition between Sunnyside and, a, and, and the Acres home area. We would love to see you out there. Commissioner Garcia, Aldean Eastside loves you and we would like to partner with you to help us make our area a lot stronger. And Commissioner Cagle, all I can say is say I love you. You have been there and the Community Assistance Department has assisted us in making our school district the best that, that, that we can possibly make it. Lastly, I'd like to try to give a shout out to the Harris County uh, Department of Education who is headed by James Colbert. They support not only us, but every school district in Harris County. And we could not do what we do without the Harris County Department of Education. So on behalf of Aldine Independent School District, all of the school districts within Harris County and within the state of Texas, we say thank you for recognizing our efforts. And we stand here to help our students in any way we can. And we appreciate any help that the Commissioner's Court can give us. Thank you. Thank you all so much for the work you're doing. Judge. Yeah. Okay. Judge, thank you. 
happy New Year to you guys, and so proud. Viola, congratulations. Uh, uh, and Connie, obviously, uh, uh, the uh, spark plug out there and all things, so thank you. Thank you, guys, for really for all you do because um, making sure we got some students here, uh, making sure that uh, we prepare the next generation of leaders to uh, do better uh, with new sciences, new challenges, new math, uh, new adventures that we have yet to discover. And so you're, you're the folks that we're putting all of those uh, responsibilities, uh, your shoulders are those that uh, we're putting those responsibilities on, so we thank you. And uh, I look forward to continuing to, to partner with you guys mm -hmm. Uh, because, uh, you know, I came into this role with a education agenda. I'm proud of the SAT, ACT, uh, free college prep program that we uh, have uh, instituted. And um, already uh, close to 400 kids have gone through that program getting free, free uh, uh, support. And uh, we know that, the, you know, what the value of a good score is. And so we, we thank you. You're, you know, you're... Uh, uh, I've said on occasion that not only is a healthy uh, community a good economy, but obviously a, a smart and prepared community is a much stronger economy as well. So <laughs> congratulations and thank you all. Yeah, Commissioner Ellis. I want to welcome you as well. I'm glad that you're here. And Paul, I'm out there quite a bit. I, I guess I should call you. Yes. I call, I call <laughs> your colleagues, but I don't, I don't call you. You might run over and tell Cago okay. that I'm in the neighborhood. <laughs> Well, we're spending a lot of money out there. We've got a lot of partnerships going and look forward to working with all of you. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And ask Randy when I'm in the neighborhood. <laughs> We're neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Garcia has an exciting resolution to present. Yes. <clears throat> so the crowd roared. Uh, because this resolution, Judge, is to once again uh, recognize uh, the North Shore Senior High School Mustangs football team. Uh, and this resolution reads, whereas the North Shore Senior High School Must Mustangs football team became the UIL six, uh, Class 6A Division I champions for the sec second consecutive year on Saturday, December 22nd, 2019, before a crowd of 47,818 fans at the AT&T uh, AT Stadium in Arlington, Texas, defeating the Duncanville Panthers. And whereas with a 31-17 victory over Duncanville, the Mustangs defended their title in the state's largest classification. And whereas North Shore began and ended the season ranked number one in the 2019 Max Preps Texas Top 25. And whereas junior quarterback Demetrius Davis Jr. Where are you? All right. A Virginia Tech pledge rushed for 115 yards threw for 91 yards, and scored two touchdowns to help North Shore repeat as champions. And whereas, you know, that performance sounded uh, a lot like what I just saw this past weekend, too, uh, by another guy named Deshaun. <laughs> and whereas uh, Davis, a junior, opened the scoring with a 30-yard run in the first quarter, followed by a 39-yard field goal by John Villalobos. Where are you, John? We got a Villalobos here as well. Uh, congratulations. And um, to give North Shore a 10-7 lead. And whereas in the second half, North Shore scored a one-yard touchdown run by Roger Hagan Jr. Where are you, Roger? Midway through the third quarter, before Davis, fired a 44-yard scoring pass to Charles King late in the fourth quarter to clinch it. And whereas the Mustangs, after a season opener loss to Katie, finished the season with a 15 straight with 15 straight wins, its uh, fourth 
state title in school history, and third since 2015. Now, therefore, be it resolved that this commissioner's court honors North Shore Senior High School Mustangs for their athleticism, leadership, and contribution to the community of Harris County. Congratulations, guys, and coach, congratulations. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I also want to make sure we recognize uh, Dr. Angie Williams. Are you here? Uh, there you are. Good to see you. Please join these young men. Uh, Dr. Joe uh, Coleman, where are you? Please. And um, uh, Vivian Dancy, please. Uh, we got John Kay. Good to see you, Coach. Uh, let's see. We got all the – and then we have um, uh, Kenneth Bryant the North Shore High, um, high school 10th grade principal. No, please, please. Uh, we have David uh, Pearson, the ninth grade campus principal. All right, and I want to make sure I haven't left anyone off. And I, I will just, I will just uh, before we ask uh, these folks to uh, share some remarks, the game, look, uh, there's days I wake up and uh, I hear a lot of noise coming out of this body uh, because of my years on the field. Um, and I will just say that uh, it's exciting to be out there. Obviously, without a doubt, it's exciting to be able to hold, have that ring and, and be a champion. And uh, you guys have experience in, in your lifetime, two consecutive championships. Rarely does that ever happen. Uh, but I also want to tell these students, these uh, athletes, that uh, do not stray from the classroom just because you're a champion, all right? Uh, because you won't be able to run those 115 yards very often when you get our age. Uh, Speak for yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, ride, you ride 115 <laughs> yards. Uh, but uh, what these uh, educators will provide you will carry you for a lifetime. Uh, so we're extremely proud, but uh, as I said uh, to you uh, last, uh, last year, is that uh, you are leaders. This resolution identifies you as leaders. It also identifies you as role models. Uh, I ask you uh, that that is an incredible uh, badge of honor. I ask you to wear it well, uh, and I ask you to... Um, inspire others uh, to persevere and to excel as you have. Um, and I know that uh, that attitude will take you far. And so we're looking forward to seeing what comes out of Virginia Tech. Uh, we're, we're, there you are. We're looking to see what comes out of Virginia Tech. You know, you could have picked a Texas school, just, <laughs> just saying. Uh, but listen, we are so proud. Uh, Dr. Williams, uh, you're, you're at the tip of the spear of, these, of this exciting uh, announcement. Uh, if you'd like to share some words and then coach, and then we'd like to hear from the athletes. Thank you, Commissioner, um, Judge Hidalgo, and other commissioners. Thank you all, first of all, for the honor uh, to be present today. Uh, thank you for recognizing the hard work of these wonderful young men. Uh, you said it well, that it is a badge of honor, and they take it very seriously. Uh, they don't only play well on the field, but they do well in the community, uh, in a lot of community service to the elderly, but also to our younger students. Uh, we're blessed in Galena Park, and we're going to keep fighting every single day for our children in East Houston. So I would like to now uh, introduce the wonderful, magnificent Coach John K. Amen. to give some remarks as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just be, on behalf of the program and, and uh, Galena Park ISD and, and everybody, it's just an honor to be here. Really appreciate the recognition of our kids. Um, you know, we're, we've been in public education a long time. It's good to see Aldean ISD here. We're very similar. And, uh, you know, in my estimation, it's uh, the, the athletics is the greatest 
at-risk program in the public schools mm. today, and, and we're, we're very, very honored to, to not only represent the east side of Houston in our precinct, but all of Houston, uh, especially against a Dallas school. You know, uh, that's an uh, exciting part for us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, again, you, you hit the nail on the head. These kids are leaders, and uh, I can tell you the, the city of Houston doesn't want anyone else representing them like these young men. Very honored to be here and, and appreciate the recognition. Thank you all. Thank you. Would any of you guys like to say a few words? Come on. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Virginia Tech. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'm just thankful for all my teammates, my coaches, the community, everyone that supported me from January 2019 all the way to December 2019. You know, they showed all love and support, and we got the job done for them. You guys right. make you. your county proud. Keep it up. That's right. Keep it That's up. Right. Congratulations. And, John, let me just tell you that uh, this uh, weekend it was a kicker who sealed our playoff victory. All right? Be proud of that. Congratulations. All right, let's take pictures with the yeah. honorees. You guys first. <clears throat>
Don't eat all that today. We're not gonna be in here all day today. Well, we, well, just in case. It's, yeah. it's yeah. a just in case. <laughs> it's, a, it's a just in case. I bring I bring the salt free ones in here. <laughs> Let's go back. Oh. All right. So that's it for the for the resolutions. Let's move on to the agenda, starting with County Engineer. Uh, yes, Judge. Uh, two items I want to point out. First, on page three, we have eight of the uh, studies where it's implementing for houses that flooded during Imelda but did not flood during Harvey. And we're using the same process we did for the one Harvey. We're doing the initial uh, 2D modeling and study to figure out what the problem is. And if you'll go to page five, Item. And that, John, that's uh, item F, correct? Page two? Uh, no, page three. three. Page three. Which three. item? Uh, it's, it's multiple. Oh, item okay. six, nine, oh, right, ten, right, right. eleven, and so on. Got anywhere, it. Anywhere where it says drainage improvements. These and are all the Melba. The flooded in Melba, but not, not Harvey, Harvey, to tell us what improvements well, need to be done. Right, and, 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 it, and it's related to the infrastructure and the subdivision because they're not in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. right. And then on page five, item K, uh, those are, are uh, the study reports. Uh, there's five of them we're asking court to approve, and, and the importance of this is this is the last five from Harvey. So of the 105 subdivisions that the county engineer's office initiated uh, design solutions on, all of the reports have come to commissioner's court and been approved except for these five. So these will be the final five, and from here they go into design. And, and the vast, the rest of them are, are just starting design now. Thank you so much for that, for yes. moving quickly. Flood control. Toll road. I wanted to point out on page eight, um, item. 3B, the agreement with NTEC for, for design services in the Sam Houston Tollway. I know we're seeking more data on traffic conditions, um, but I just wanted to make sure, is Gary here or someone from the toll road? There should be someone in the back, Judge. Yeah. So this, from what I understand, it's looking at some traffic issues that have been reported. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Mr. Treach, first of all, we all received your your letter of uh, resignation this past week, and I, I do want to take this opportunity to thank you for your work over the years, and uh, I'll have something on the agenda at the next court to talk about. Uh, um, interim while we look for a replacement. But I, I did want to say, and we spoke on the phone, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Gary, for all that work. Likewise. Uh, on this one, so this, as I understand, it's exploring some a traffic issue that's been reported by the industrial park, uh, as well as the number of lanes, correct? Correct. It's uh, Gary Treach, Executive Director of Harris County Toll Road Authority. Uh, this is just a study to look at the ramps, the intersections, and the uh, number of lanes uh, we need. Uh, I tell people, if they tell me I need to add a lane in five years, we'll probably go ahead and do it. If they tell me it's 20 years, I ain't going to do it. But I want that to be 
a part of this study so we just know what the traffic is going to be. Uh, we've already gotten reports that uh, this was designed by TxDOT as a non-toll road and uh, some of the uh, ramps are too close to the intersections. So I, I really don't know what uh, will come out of the study, but I want somebody to at least look at the whole quarter and the whole thing. Great. Yeah, and I know for this, it's important to collect the data to see what the issue is. And my, my note to you would just be to make sure that we don't assume that widening the highway is necessarily the solution. So how do we address the situation, not just is it feasible to widen? Uh, so that was just what I wanted to be okay. sure to mention to you at court. And that's very true. Great. Thank you. Yes, yes. Commissioner Cagle and then Commissioner Ellis. Thank you for your service. And I, and I got your letter of, of impending retirement as well. And it made me sad because of the great skill and effort that you've given to us. And I appreciate what, what you've rendered. And I, I want to take this opportunity to, uh, to speak about how you do do data-driven effort. And one of the, the most important ones that I recall was on 249 to where uh, you did your studies that showed that the population in that area where 249 and Tomball was going to be was going to double in 15 years. And the most expensive part of the project was the building of the bridge sections. So instead of building a bridge based upon the data that would be outdated in 15 years, I think that the incremental cost is between 3 and 6% to go ahead and add the extra lane that you're going to need in 15 years and went ahead and built and striped off the extra lanes. Uh, so that it would already be there for the future based upon the data that you would know that you would need, but the cost in 15 years to tear down the existing bridges and build new, bigger ones would have been extraordinary. And by that foresight on your part, you saved the taxpayers a lot of money. Uh, and uh, as it's already proven that the volume of usage on those roads has been a lot higher than we had even anticipated, so that 15 years might be a little shorter than what we mm -hmm. first thought. And so thank you for using your data and your research to drive your engineering and the way that you construct. And uh, I think that, that there, are, there are many aspects of all of that, that that will go into your hopper of the great successes that you have, the opening of the Direct Connect from, from 249 to Beltway 8. But the addition of that one lane when you could do it for 3%, 4%, whatever it was, which would have cost us double the normal price in 10 to 15 years. That one was one of your uh, greatest achievements that the taxpayers should be forever grateful to you for. Thank you. Commissioner Ellis. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Tree, since this item under tow road says, recommendation that appropriate officials take necessary actions to complete the transaction <coughs> is broad enough to, uh, to say a little something about you as well. And, I scheduled lunch with you last week. I had uh, no idea that you were going to resign. I saw the letter. If I'd known you were going to retire, I'd have given you more than that black bean burger <laughs> and that kale salad. So I want to. That was, that was pretty good. Yeah, I apologize for that. But uh, look, I knew you when you were the district engineer, uh, obviously, and during the three years that I've been here. And I just want to thank you for your, for your service. Thank you, sir. I know you're such a bashful guy, but I hope you let us do something. You know, I, I mentioned it to him, Judge, I and he said, I'm not, I don't want to party. I just want to, he said, I told my sister, don't come in here with a cake, uh, but I hope we can do something for you. Uh, I just you want to slip out. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Reddy. You know, Gary, um, what, Textile 41 years? Yes. Well, you know, when you left, I, um, I um, decided we were going to name a park after your wife, so we did. We put your name on it as well. But uh, the amazing thing, that many things you came up with, but on the Katy Freeway expansion from the West Loop all the way to Katy, what a lot of people don't know is how you insisted on getting rid of all the open ditches, uh, you name it, that was in those open ditches, and building sidewalks on both sides 
it was I ten, all the way from basically the West Loop to Katy, which gave all kind of people the incentive to actually start maintaining their sidewalks in front of the many different buildings that are there, including auto dealers and all that. You, you, and then the incredible landscaping. I mean, you know, you kind of, kind of an environmentalist in your own way, and 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 you care about parks, and that's why we obviously wanted to name a park after you. But I, we'll have to go do something else to make it nicer now. But truly, <laughs> but I, 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 I admire you. I always have, and uh, you, 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 are kind of a quiet guy. But you're one smart dude, and I appreciate you. Thank you. Are we okay to continue this discussion, Robert? You're okay because uh, if it's offers of thanks, that's appropriate. Yes, Commissioner. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Gary, also want to extend my appreciation to you. Um, anyone who works in government, um, you know, takes on an incredible amount of responsibility, and uh, you're delivering uh, services to members of the community who uh, don't know yet that they're going to benefit from the work being done. So uh, we're very, very grateful to you. And subsequently, I know you don't do it alone, but you got to help a team uh, yes, that do. you'll, uh, you're leaving behind. And, and I just want to tell you that in your, uh, in your, uh, in, in many meetings, rather, uh, John Tyler and Peter and others have uh, represented you well. Uh, and uh, and I think you got a pretty good shop over there. And so, again, thank you for uh, your leadership. And I will echo, Commissioner, yes, we do. That's the one good thing about retiring and leaving. I'm, I'm going to leave it in well-protected well hands uh, so no one has to worry about uh, whatever comes next. I've told them all they'll do just fine. Just keep doing what you do. Thank you. Okay. Budget management. I have a note here on items uh, 4H1 and 2 on page 9. Uh, request that no action be taken. That's correct. Anything else? Legislative relations. Universal services. Um, Judge, I've uh, got a, a question on, uh, on item A. <clears throat> I brought this up, I um, believe, at the last meeting regarding uh, this uh, computer aided uh, dispatch and records management system. Um, you know, since that last conversation, um, I have gotten a lot of feedback from uh, constables and sheriff deputies uh, about how um, how this system has been a drag on the productivity of those deputies. Uh, you know, when I was in office, we had a lot of challenges with Tiburon, and this was supposed to be a solution uh, to the challenges we were having with Tiburon. It's actually been worse. And, um, and, um, and I believe that the amount of money we've already dumped into this thing is closer to the $8 million mark than the $4 million uh, that, that uh, was mentioned at the last meeting. So I've got a lot of concerns about this, uh, Judge, and uh, the, you know, I, think it's, I think it's important that we figure out an exit plan on this uh, on this particular item uh, because we're uh, continuing to put good money into you know behind bad money. Uh, this thing doesn't work, doesn't work like it was intended, and uh, and I think we have to figure out a way to make sure that those deputies aren't sitting behind a computer trying to do a simple simple process or report, uh, and it's uh, keeping those guys. Uh, off the streets. So I'm not sure what the step is. I'm not sure if it is uh, what is the challenge. Uh, I guess I'd ask Dwight, what's the challenge on uh, on holding off on 
on paying this until we have an exit plan. Commissioner, I have to defer to Bill. Well, my understanding, I mean, this is, they sold the uh, note uh, to this other company, and this is a legal obligation of the county. Um, I'd have to have the county attorneys look into it, whether if you didn't pay this, uh, what the ramifications were. But this isn't actually the company that sold us the equipment. Mm -hmm. Robert, any and, thoughts and, on this? Well, I mean, I think, Commissioner, what we can do as an office is certainly look at all the different concerns that have been raised about this particular equipment. If it's not been performing as promised, if there are maybe breaches of contract, and I don't know if there are or not, I just haven't right. looked at it. But we're, we can look at that, and that can be done independently of whether this obligation is paid or not. Uh, now, I'd be reluctant to advise the commissioners not to pay an obligation that is due, particularly in the fourth year of the five-year agreement. But at the same time, we can we can work to maybe remedy or recover money if money is owed, that sort of thing. So to clarify, we already purchased this. We're just paying back the loan. That's yes. But that's what Robert is saying is it's worth looking into, like Commissioner said, whether whether there was any promise that wasn't kept Correct. For, as to the performance of the system. Now, since we've already paid for this, ideally we'll be looking at a new system since this one's not good. And my, my point would just be, like with we've talked about the different uh, techno technological systems we need across law enforcement to make sure that they're actually uh, working toward reform, working together before we commit to something else like this. Uh, yes, do I, oh, Commissioner Reddick. Bruce, how bad is the system? We didn't get everything delivered that we were supposed to. Um, We've tried to, we've worked with the vendor as much as we could get out of them as far as officer safety issues, and I think we've addressed the majority of those. Uh, there is some performance issues that we set those expectations when it was decided that we needed to buy it, and uh, it's living up to its expectations as far as that. And uh, we're more than willing to, you know, we're in the middle of gathering requirements. Uh, again, the last one was a little over uh, 3,000 pieces of paper and we're in the middle of gathering the requirements to how, how do we get off of here and get onto a new system that meets the needs of the officers. How long we had this? Uh, right at six. Hmm? We, we decided to get it about six years ago. We're on the fourth payment. We started paying when we went into production. But the, there are a lot of people involved in agreeing with this system, were they not? Absolutely. All we, our part was just the technical uh, technology side of things, the business established the requirements, did the reviews, and uh, uh, picked the product. Yeah, but who, who pushed for the system? Well, the, the, the constables and the sheriff, the, de the people that are using it. And they Law were enforcement. all involved? Absolutely. Who was the sheriff? I think Hickman. Hmm? I think Sheriff Hickman. Okay. But that, did that process start before Hickman? There was concerns with uh, what they were on before Tiburon. And uh, yeah, and then it got moved over to us after the implementation over to the US before I even uh, was responsible for uh, the technology, uh, US now. And um, at that point is when we, the, the law enforcement community decided that we need to look at a new solution and they went with uh, Superion to replace it. And then Superion quit investing in their product because they bought Tiburon, and now that's their main product. And, and also there were a number of constables that were there then or that weren't there now. That's correct. So there's been a lot of change. Yes, a lot of change. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Garcia and then Commissioner Ellis. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, the, um, the the issues with, well, first of all, who is the largest user of this system? Of course, the sheriff's office. And which agency, or rather, um, is there any other client that they have that is comparable to Harris County? Absolutely not. Okay. And, um, I mean, this system would work well for a very, very small agency. Possibly. Yeah. But not or behemoth like what is Harris County. Correct. And um, 
And the challenges with Superion and Tiburon uh, are not new. No. And um, there's been a lot of work uh, trying to merge Houston Police Department, which is on Tiburon, um, and the Sheriff's Office so that we could get to a universal report so that uh, bad guys can't slip between the cracks of agency uh, uh, reports and systems. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, uh, if not for the institutional knowledge, probably wouldn't be raising this question on this item today. And so the one thing that I uh, would hope that you will consider in the future is that um, it would uh, be very helpful that we count on your on your uh, creating awareness amongst this body to let us know what the challenges are so that we don't have to have conversations like this. This is um, a lot of constable, constables, uh, deputies have, uh, and, and sheriff's deputies are having a lot of conversation about this item Absolutely. as we speak since I last raised it. Right. They were excited that I raised the issue on this because they had been frustrated with this thing for a long time. Uh, yet there's been no conversation in some of the meetings that you and I have had, there's been no, no um, uh, uh, outcry, I guess, for lack of better words, to ask for support to find ways to fix this issue. Right. Uh, so I, I'm just hoping that uh, you um, think about providing us with more insight to what the challenges are in your shop so we don't have to find out about them this way. But I would um, strongly encourage some reforms on how these uh, the law enforcement technology uh, committee works uh, because the sheriff's office is the 80% user of the system, uh, yet they get 1% uh, of say in, uh, in what direction the county goes. And, and, and I, agree with, I, I agree that uh, we probably need to figure out how to uh, make the community work uh, as one. And um, the committee, the technology committee, actually the chairs establish the uh, bylaws and the guidance and uh, the mission statement and all those things. So the, the sheriff and has more votes than anybody else, of course. And um, and if there's stuff that they need to look at, they need to they need to come back with uh, that recommendation. That's all gone through court. Commissioner Ellis, and then Commissioner Cable. This is the fourth of five payments. Fourth of five, yes, sir. So there will be another one. There so will be another one. Essentially, the same amount. It the exact yeah. same amount, yes, sir. And and I can tell you that there's no way that we can implement a solution before that next that fifth payment comes in. And if there is some liability or some fault on the part of the vendor, what's the process for seeking redress? For we, we have a bond for the amount of money that we paid that is still outstanding, that uh, we've already started working with the uh, purchasing in the county attorney's office to uh, see if it's worthy of uh, executing against. We do that on all enterprise solutions. Yeah, I'm just hoping, are, are there any other contracts like this that you know about in your shop? I, I would just hate to be in a position where we, when we find out it's too late, and with all due respect, we say, well, some committee or somebody recommended, and they gone now. I mean, I, you know, I'm a pretty old guy, but I'm in good shape. If I last a long time, I don't want to, if I outlive some of you all, I don't, I don't want to be blamed and, and somebody say, well, you know, a committee asked for it and they're gone now. I mean, right. how do we, should well, it ought to be somewhere, whether it's you or. We're anxious to replace it with, with a bigger and better and more advanced in, in technology. It's just, it's, it's a big ship. There's a, the, the, the unique thing of Harris County is we have several agencies on it where most of the time uh, these kind of solutions are bought specifically for an, ag uh, an agency. And I know that's a elemental respect for the independence of various of the elected officials but to the extent 
we have to vote to appropriate the money at least. I, for one, don't take the position because somebody else who doesn't have to vote on the money said do it this way, and then I feel like I have to do it that way. I don't, so is that, in the past, has that sort of been the attitude of some other group, some other elected official says this is what I want, we just open the checkbook? No, I haven't seen that from a technology perspective. It's always been a business-driven decisions and recommend, well, no decisions are made except by y'all, but uh, recommendations to commissioner's court from so, those committees. Yeah, if you see something, I, I, I hope you'll, you'll say something. Obviously, we couldn't keep up with it, it just in your space. Right. In, in, in that space or any, any other department would clearly say it. And not, we don't, I don't want to find out about by happenstance or because we read it in the paper. I just prefer to know whether it's privately or just put it on the agenda. Sometimes sure. we, our memories do fade. Sure. And we, tend to, we tend to forget, so it's better if it's just on the agenda and there's a record of it. Well, these are big systems. A lot of people depend on it. Life depends on it, and we take it seriously. And, uh, of course, we're, we're working with the business to get the I's dotted and the T's crossed on every need that they have where we make sure that uh, that's in the product. Is there a need for additional resources on your team to monitor this kind of stuff? Or I'm just, and if you don't know now, you can tell us later, but if there's a need to do something so checks and balances are in place, I at least feel the responsibility to, to ask when there's a discussion about the fourth. We have we have people in my department that are embedded in the in the. I mean, they actually go to roll call to find out what the issues are that day or what happened the day before, where we can address those issues immediately. There's just some concerns that the product has not uh, delivered everything that uh, they had committed to. Yes, Commissioner Cable. Just so that I understand the timeline, maybe it's the old judge of me coming out. We had a problem with the old system, which was the Tiburon system. Yes, sir. Everybody agreed it was not working. The technology committee then went out and sought and found what they thought to be a new product that was <coughs> going to be superior. But then the new company, after we bought it, we bought it like you buy a car. We're buying it, and then Bank of America is the one that's holding the note. So we're stuck paying this note over on the side. But we bought the new product, and after we bought the new product, those people bought the old system that we tried to move away from and are trying to stick us with what we tried to move away from. That's correct. They've decided that that was the platform that they were going to move forward on. So we were trying to buy a Ford, but somehow or another we ended back with the Chevy. Well, we, don't, we don't have the Chevy yet. They, they bought Ford and they're not doing anything with it. Okay. Um, and... Thank you for that explanation. And I, I judge J.J. Watt here next to me, and this is hard, this little thing he keeps poking me with. He's wanting to say something, and so I'll give the rest of my question time to uh, J.J. Watt with your with your grace. I was just going to say, I think Bruce brought it up. We have a bond in place, and we'll work, we've been working with legal already to look at that bond and see what we can do to recover, and we'll continue to do that, Commissioner, so we can see if we're recovering the funds. In the meantime, we'll do the new procurement working with Bruce's shop. Um, as far as the committee members, I think that the, I guess the committee would have to work with technology committee on how many votes, who gets what, because uh, last time that committee was given to us by the technology committee, correct? Correct. So the, the list of folks who vote, how they vote? Correct. So we'll have to work through that issue too, because my office just uh, reaches out to them and asks them for what, who's on the committee and which groups are what, and the sheriff needs to have four votes, and the uh, constables get four votes. Uh, we'll have to work with those guys to do technology. I don't know how that works as far as how their bylaws are set up. Right. That that is that's the the first the first meeting is to establish who's going to be the co-chairs. It's all elected officials. We're not on the co-chair list. We're not even members of the committee. And then uh, at that point, they establish how they want to move forward and work together. And if it needs to be more stringent or come through commissioner's court for that. <coughs> Um, I, I'll definitely encourage that. We're, we're in place to basically facilitate the meetings, get everybody together, make sure it happens, and get some action items out of it so we understand what we need to do to move forward. So, yeah, and by nature, these are fragmented in a way, these discussions, but I think the benefit we have right now is we've got PFM looking at the whole justice system, and they also happen to be doing the, the county review. So 
ideally they can help us connect the dots uh, across the technology with the sure. bail reform commitments on data collection and reporting and then making sure that the system support programs like site and release and the adequate uh, adequately support the needs of law enforcement on a day-to-day -day basis yeah so judge I, I want to ask purchasing so <clears throat> I'll, I'll maybe universal services the committee recommended the vendor so would the, the law permit us the product, the product. Yes, sir. The, product. the solution. The yes, sir. solution. Correct. Is that essentially the vendor? Yes. Sir. Okay. So would the law permit us to ask whichever department is going to be handling it, in addition to whatever committee recommends, to tell us, put it on the agenda, do they agree or disagree? I, I just at the end of the day, I don't want to come back and I'm trying to blame some committee, right. and then people say, well, we don't, we don't. Those folks who were on that committee are gone. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, right. and I assume they do they vote by secret ballot? Is it public? But at the end of the day, you know, if something's coming out of my out of my precinct, I may have some committee go through all of that. What, but what at happened? some point somebody's gonna blame me. To make sure. What happened was it's like a normal RFP process. Each member of this committee, which is one of each constable's office and two of the sheriffs, were actually voting members. They went through and evaluated the proposal, did the presentation present that information to us. We have a recommendation from the evaluation committee for the procurement, which is what we do for all our people. And then, but there was not, not there was, y'all weren't overseeing the project at the time. It was the technology, you were just sitting alongside, right? Correct. Because y'all weren't responsible for it. This technology department was created, from what I understand, with these voting members and their ability to, to evaluate for their department, meaning the law enforcement. And they gave us a recommendation mm -hmm. for the scores, they did all the evaluations like we would normally do for an RFP, and then that recommendation came to court based on their... So I guess what I'm asking is, does the law require... So in the business that I used to be in, right. if, if I came to Harris County and I'm trying to be an uh, underwriter, or, 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 or as a lawyer, if I was trying to be the co-bond counsel or be the manager, run the books, uh, there may be some committee looking at it, but at some point, generally, my sense was when it came to this court you know somebody whoever was in Mr. Jackson's slot was saying I agree with this I don't agree I don't think it was some you know I may have somebody on my staff that goes to some committee me never even asked me right. you know what I think I may not know but at the end of the day somebody right. has to be responsible for what the five of us vote on mm -hmm. because we can't manage so, so it sounds like for next steps on this, you guys will review whether or not there was some sort of um, failure to deliver what was promised, and then going forward as we replace the system, work with PFM and make sure that court gets a chance to evaluate what system we implement, not just sort of checking a box on what some committee recommended. Is that right? And, and I'm saying I want to make sure on this one we walk through it because I, at some point I want to find some department head. Somebody I can say, you agree with this, not not if the law permits that. I, w I would think, I mean, yeah. off the top of my head, I can't think of any reason why not. Yeah. And ultimately, Dwight's correct in that this, this body votes on it in a public meeting at which people can sign up to speak. And certainly maybe it's a notion that the commissioner's court needs to invite comments on these kind of major projects. That's another thought. You had a comment, though. Yeah, a couple things. Um, one, I, I totally agree that the elected official or department heads that are affected by the product, whether it's this or voter <coughs> change or whatever, if they have a problem, sort of like when you get married, does anybody have an objection here or whatever, they need to come up and put that on the record and not say, well, you know, I voted against that and I really didn't think that years later. So that's, that's one suggestion just over my years of experience. The other one is... Dwight, and on these major kind of projects like this, we work really hard to have an unbelievable credit rating, and we get some of the lowest interest rates, and these companies really can't compete against that. Right. So as my father taught me, when you go to buy a car, just tell them, what do I have to write the check for? Don't tell me about the financing, don't all, because they start baking that in, and you really don't know what you're spending. <coughs> so in the future, on all these, I'd like a cash option, because we internally can pay for this through commercial paper and then long term. And then if they have financing, maybe that's fine. But I've found over the last 25 years being here that almost every single time our financing is so much cheaper 
than the vendors or for buying a building, a lease purchase, and all that. So I would request that our department um, be involved in that part of the decision. Yeah, we haven't. That's not a. Sorry. I was yeah. out of turn. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Commissioner Garcia. Thank, thank you, uh, Judge. Um, uh, Bruce, on I, I'm, I'm, this I'm trying to remember, is there any charge back to any of the agencies, the constables or the sheriff, on uh, use of Superion? No, sir. There's, uh, are you requiring, as you did with Tiburon, to have uh, staff from those departments sit at uh, stations, workstations? Or what? Tiburon used to require us to give you like four or five people to do date, some type of data entry. I don't remember what it was. This Superion required that kind of support from the department. No, our, our help desk uh, supports, and we have a team that's specifically for supporting <coughs> what's going on with Superion. Um, the uh, and and again, Bruce, I you know, uh, my tone is a little tense right now because. If I hadn't raised this, we wouldn't be aware that there's a problem with this system when and we would be writing a check without any consideration about what this county may be owed. That's not okay. good. I, I got it. And uh, just, just to clarify, I mean, we have already, the, the last co-chair meeting was an agreement for us to move forward with establishing and understanding the requirements where we can move forward with replacing it. Yeah, and yeah. the vote was unanimous for this product from the law enforcement community the the other thing too is that I would um, really uh, make sure that there's value given to the fact mm -hmm. that the sheriff's office is the 80% user of this system absolutely Commissioner, right. thank mm -hmm. you for bringing it up too by the way let me get uh, Commissioner uh, Reddick and then Commissioner Cagle um, you know the the, the the interesting thing here is that the users, the sheriff, the constables, you know, it's their responsibility, the sovereign elected officials, it's their responsibility to speak up if they think something's bad. Particularly when you take into account that I've seen, what, five, at least five different sheriffs, okay, since I've been here. Uh, and so you, you know, like I said earlier, you have turnover. And the fact is, if, if department heads and elected officials don't have the intestinal fortitude to stand up and say something we got sucks, we got a problem. Maybe it's because some of them that made the decision don't want to face the reality they made the wrong decision. True. So if this has been around a problem there are some people who should have spoken up about it. They could do it every year at budget. They can come in here any day they want. They can pick up the telephone. So in a way, some of them have lived with something and just kept it quiet. Do you agree with that? I mean, I haven't seen anybody come to Commissioner's Court talking about it. I, I don't think they brought it to court. I mean, they, they notify us of when there's issues. We're, we're tracking any uh, defaults or defects in the solution with the vendor, um, their pace has gone down to zero. Uh, the last meeting we actually had Superion with the co-chairs of the law enforcement, which are all elected officials, by the way, and uh, they got their chance, their opportunity to explain what their concerns were and uh, the encouragement from the vendor, which owns both products now, uh, encouraged us to move to the new solution. And uh, we just have to make sure that it meets our needs, the, the law enforcement needs, uh, as we move forward, because we do need to go out and bid this. We don't want to just move to their product. Thank you. Commissioner Cagle. Six years ago, I was here, and I don't remember anybody disagreeing at all with this new system. It was supposed to solve all the old problems. Do you remember anybody disagreeing with the system? It was unanimous from the law enforcement community to move to this solution. But the, there and again, then, that's the only other solution and, that was and not out to, there and did. Not to, to get too much in the way of the county attorneys, but there's the bait and switch. We bought one thing and we got something switched back to us somewhere else, and that's why I think the solution to going back against the vendor 
is a good solution. Question number two, this is a good learning lesson for us, which um, um, this kind of goes to purchasing. If we had this kind of a problem with this big chunk of technology, we need to make sure that we don't have the same kind of problems when we go to voting machines. And I don't want to go beyond that at this time because that's not on the agenda that's right here. But, but in terms of identifying a problem that we have that we need to make sure that we protect ourselves in other areas, I do want to raise that and would ask that we make sure that we, we, we stay on top of those questions. These solutions that we're rolling out touch a lot of people. Uh, Commissioner Garcia and Commissioner Cagle, y'all were both on the committee that uh, decided for us to move forward with replacing the justice system. We looked all over the place. We actually tried to buy a product. We couldn't. We built it inside. It took us four and a half, five years. Is that, that, that was Dallas the, thing that we went to and they were getting all the flashy stuff and all that? Bit. Yeah, that, 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 that kind of didn't work. But anyway, uh, the e ERP, another one. This is, a, this, is, this is unique because it's a decision and recommendation coming down from commissioner's court for us to replace IFAS. Not to, so the, there wasn't a whole lot of requirements gathering out in front of the business community because our main effort this round is to replace IFAS and get it out of here. And so these systems are huge. They touch a lot of people. It doesn't make everybody happy. Not saying that it's not a good solution. It is not a good solution over there supporting law enforcement. But this is, this is the environment we're in. So. All right. Yes. Just, just a final point. Right. I, I, I do want to reiterate, reiterate again how Please, I am that Commissioner Garcia <clears throat> did bring the issue up, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I do think it's appropriate to look and see uh, to what extent we can hold the vendor under the bond under, under some process level, and whether it's this item, technology item, or voting machine, or a bridge over troubled water, and I'll yeah. leave it at that. Hmm. So I appreciate now, the support because we need that when we're, we're trying to work with our vendors, and they need to understand that. And some of them are bigger than us, though, so it's a challenge. Yes. And I'll just say to that point, Bruce, um, to follow up with Commissioner Ellis, it also requires good contracts. Absolutely. Make sure that those contracts are well written. And, and so I would put that onus on the county attorney's office Certainly. to make sure that uh, the county always has a good fallback. And so uh, that's very critical. Yes, I agree, and we thank God for Barbara Armstrong every day when she writes our contracts. <laughs> so for the purposes of this item, Robert, you're going to look and see if there's anything they haven't delivered. Now, we still need to approve this payment because it's, it's, yeah, it's a, a commitment we've payment. entered into. My okay. understanding is there would be penalties if this payment is not made soon. Right. And if we find an issue, we'll deal with whatever we get from them. But it, it, it was a, a, a valuable discussion. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. So that was Universal Services. Thank you. Thank Bruce. you. Thank you. Public health. I've got a note on item 7A uh, on page 9, a request that no action be taken. Is this right, Robert? Uh, my understanding was it's B and C, but I'll ask public health. Which one do they have in mind? All right. Make sure we're all yeah, let's the same clarify. <coughs> Hello, Albert Ching with Harris County Public Health. It's a uh, 7B1. No action, please. B1. Okay. And I, well, I, I'm sorry, Albert. My understanding was all the items under B and all the items under C. I know Dr. Shaw said he talked with you this morning, but I was just, uh, when I talked to him, I was just told 7B1. So if he told you something else. Okay. Maybe you want to call him before we vote? Uh, might be a good well, let's idea come to back to this. Okay. Let's just I'll give him a come call. back to this after the break. We're all there, okay. Um, all right, community services. <clears throat> Uh, yes. Under under B, if Ms. LaMail is back there, uh, I just want to get a sense under the recovery owner housing program, what, what numbers we're talking about. Ms. LaMail, I was just asking as you came in, under item uh, B, I think that's as a result of a request I had on in December uh, about the... Uh, number program 
uh, applications that program applicants that will complete it? Yes, that's correct, Commissioner. Daphne Lamel, Community <laughs> Services Department. Uh, the report that's before you today is a transmittal of where we are with the owner housing program under um, Harvey Project Recovery. Um, I, I'm pleased to report that the pace of operation has um, did uptick in December. We were able to issue um, more than $800,000 in assistance under the reimbursement program and close out two buyouts. Uh, we have more than 7,700 applications now. Um, and these numbers that I'm giving you are actually, every day the numbers are ticking up. And so the report that was transmitted for the agenda obviously has changed since then with the numbers. But we have more than 1,200 files in eligibility review. Um, in December, we did make some changes internally with our team. Um, we've integrated Tetra Tech staff. They've brought on additional temporary staff with our staff. They're working as one team to pick up the pace because we understand where we are and the critical nature of this to get these programs moving. And so um, we have made great progress. We do have another $5.6 million that's been approved by GLO to date. We are waiting on environmental re review and release of funds for those. And we're also going to uptick our HAP program so we can start the rebuilding and reconstruction phase in the first quarter of this year. Um, Commissioner, one of the questions you had asked me is how are we compared to our peers? We are tracking our performance against our peer programs, which is the state of Texas as well as the city of Houston. Um, I looked for those numbers um, because of the end of the month and the holiday. I couldn't find city of Houston's, but we, were, we are slightly behind them but we are on track to be with them. They had 115 approved projects by GLO at the end of November. We're already up to 116 to GLO. So we are closely closing in on that. So the um, state of Texas obviously has more than 30,000 applications. They have completed 424 homes to date. So they are a little bit ahead of us. It's important to understand um, Harris County, we are a subrecipient of the state of Texas. Every file, which includes 53 unique documents, have to be submitted to GLO for their approval before we can proceed. And so, again, I'm not trying to give excuses of where we're not. Our focus right now is to focus on our applications and get our customers served. And um, that's the goal of our team right now. So, if, if I might judge. Yes. As a sub-recipient, both the city and the county have to have the applicants fill out these 53 documents. And what kind of things are in there? Um, ownership, uh, making sure you're... Uh, current on your taxes, making sure you're current on your child support, um, making sure you're current on your mortgage. Um, we have to do all of these checks and submit all of this information to GLO before we can get approval on a file, as well as the basic information about the damage you incurred, that you were affected by the storm, and, and, and all of those items. But so it's, it's voluminous. And, it is. And obviously, I can understand why they do it, because we are a sub-recipient, and if we don't get something right, they would have liability. But if we were a direct recipient, then we would um, deal with the federal government on that and not have to go through the state before the federal government. Ultimately, they'd get it from us anyway. Exactly. And, and we are preparing an audit ready file. Uh, basically, the difference is that GLO has a direct uh, relationship with HUD. HUD will come and monitor on a periodic basis. The way the state is operating this, and I don't criticize them for this, because obviously we are a subrecipient. We do the same if we were granting to another agency. They are expecting us to provide and prove to them that the file is eligible before we proceed, and they are taking their time to approve those within the time frame that they're given to ensure that the, the file is correct. And if my memory serves me correct, we operate under the rules that were given to us. And periodically, cities have been direct recipients. <clears throat> but it's been fairly rare that counties have done it. I remember when this came up, I had someone pull together a memo, and there was some in South Carolina. Correct. Some was Congressman Clyburn who was able to work that out. But it's been fairly rare around the country. A county has been a direct recipient. Exactly. Um, however, there is a new bill in Congress and, and, and going to the Senate at the federal level that hopefully will um, allow that to happen more frequently on a go-forward basis that communities that are entitlement communities that work with HUD on a regular basis can receive these grants as direct recipients. It just removes a, a, an extra administrative burden to operating the program. I know you were looking to see how we compare to the city and the state. Tetra Tech can find out hopefully easily, but maybe just in terms of the time period, in terms of when we got the allocation, how would we compare to some other region, whether it's in Sandy or someplace else, just to give us a sense of how far behind, far ahead, or on track we may or may not be. Yes, we can pull that information together. Yeah, definitely we can pull that information together. Commissioner, one of the things that we that did 
catch us off guard for this program and this disaster was the fact that our intake process did slow down, slow us down quite a bit. You know, obviously in August when we realized we weren't where we needed to be, that's kind of we've been playing catch up since then. And so we are overcoming those delays, but we will research that and get you that information. Are there additional, are there any additional resources that you need? N not at this time. We're using the staff that we have to get everything going. We've made some changes internally. We're working very closely with the GLO strike team that's embedded with our team, and they've been extremely helpful to set expectations mm -hmm. of what GLO is looking for to make sure we're getting those approvals on a much quicker turnaround on those files as we submit them. Commissioner Cagle. Um, Daphne, this is just a transmittal, and I understand that you're working with our office to try to figure out those coding issues to make sure that all the numbers work yeah. out. I think there were about five files that were off, and some of that is uh, due to the geographic tracking of the two different databases. Sometimes files that aren't coded correctly may miss out of one of the data dumps that we're doing to create the report. And when you so there's a five-file discrepancy, but we have it in there. When, yes. when you get all that squared away, make sure that we get to that, that final product on it. Okay. Thank you for working with us to get those... Sure. Coding issues squared away. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. know you guys worked over the, the break and, and you won't let off. We still have a lot of catching up to do. We, we do. Uh, as always, let us know what you need from us. Thank okay. You, thank, thank, thank you. May I speak on that issue? May I can speak on that issue about mere, mere person. Oh. Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Please state your name and affiliation. My name is Mir Garcia, and I applied for the reimbursement program. We have been complaining in my community a lot because this has taken too long, and I hope it is not a program that ends up like <coughs> losing millions of dollars like the last program that was explained here, that uh, you all didn't find out until too late. Too many million dollars were spent on a program that didn't work. So this program that was established it started long time ago. We have been waiting almost three years to get the reimbursement, and it is not right. We're suffering a lot, especially in my community, that we were uh, flooded thanks to the fact that Harris County never has done anything to improve that area. I do not um, am against uh, beautifying Houston and having more streets and, 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 and drainage around museums and all that so they don't flood. But please, do not invest on those museums before you invest in people's housings. Because the house is more important. It's a lot more important. Or children have loved, suffered a lot. I have suffered a lot. And it is not only because we're not comfortable. We, it, that issue of the Harvey hurricane and Danny Imelda was a very big problem. And I am asking you to please first attend to the people's needs before you attend to beautifying anything else. Parks are wonderful, museums are wonderful. I'm an educator and I am for those. But please do not invest on those before you invest everything that you have available for the, for the housing, for the reimbursement programs, for the rebuilding programs. And if they are not talking enough to say that they need more resources or more people to work on them because they have a lot of applications, I'm telling you that you need to look into that so that all those people can have more help and get all that money to the people that need it, like me. And this is for the future. I'd like to thank the engineer that I have called several times until he got a little bit upset with me, but that day I called to thank him because last time that I came to talk, I asked for, for something done on my street, and it was done. Some debris was left, but it was done, and I'm thankful, very thankful. The whole street people, we are all very thankful to you because nothing had been done there for more than 20 years. Mm. All my neighbors have access, uh, told me all this. I didn't know. And the most important thing, those rail uh, road tracks, they're acting as a Thank you so much. wall Thank you. to get us all flooded. Thank you. You need to get okay. those I've, people you, We to have do to stop everyone at time. Now. I'm so sorry. But thank you for coming. Yes, Commissioner Garcia. Thank you, Judge. 
Uh, Mead, thank you for coming uh, down and speaking. In fact, your voice is often the voice that I transmit to Ms. Uh, um, the um, And I would appreciate that it sounds like you're, you have one of the applications that is in some transition. And um, one of the things that Ms. Lamell and I spoke about yesterday is that probably most most uh, often it is the aspect of income verification that is uh, most challenging for folks to figure out how to do that and what documentation to bring. And so I've, I've uh, challenged Ms. Lamell to uh, think through a way to do it instantaneously with some authorization with people making applications when they're coming to do everything we can to expedite this process because I wholeheartedly agree that I have um, uh, a great degree of anxiety, not as much as yours, because you're the you're the victim. You're you're the person suffering. Uh, I'm just trying to do my part mm -hmm. to uh, make sure that the bureaucracy works on your behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do have a lot of uh, anxiety that this process is taking a long time. There's a there's a lot of red tape, regretfully involved, um, and uh, but at the end of the day, when we have the resources. Uh, we ought to make sure that we're doing everything humanly possible to get those resources to the end users like yourself. So thank you for coming down and speaking on that. But your concerns are some of the concerns I've been uh, putting out in Ms. Love Mel's lap. Thank you. And I'm not talking just for myself. I know. I know. I know. So am I. We appreciate it, but, uh, thank you. I'm sorry that we have heard that we're doing it and we're doing it and we're doing it. Thank you. Thank you so much, and to Director Lamel, it, it, it is heartbreaking to hear these stories, and it, it's been far too long. So we, you know, part of it's the red tape, as Commissioner said, um, but every every little bit that is on us, we will continue holding everyone accountable and doing everything we can um, to move through quickly. So please keep us posted on what you need. Thank you. That was community services. County Library, Youth and Family Services, Constables, Sheriff. Just yeah. on uh, page 12 on the item E, <clears throat> they don't have to answer now. I'd just like for the Sheriff's Office to, to give us a report on how successful they are mm. on the number of people who are getting HIV tested and any thoughts on uh, uh, the percentage that are not getting tested on what we could do to encourage them to, uh, to get tested. And if they need some resources to help do that, they just give us a report on maybe put it on the agenda. Is anyone ready. here from the sheriff's office? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, we can And we don't have to hold up. They can, we'll pass it. We'll just pass it today. But maybe when they come back on the next item, they can give us a report on it. Are you with the sheriff? Yeah. Uh -oh. So as you come up, my question is, and if you don't have it now, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't think about it until I, I looked at it. I didn't tell my staff to alert you. Uh, so I'm wondering on the item E where you want uh, uh, some uh, additional people, uh, I guess you want to transfer uh, three grant funded positions for HIV testing, routine testing. Uh, yes, we have the strong yard international administrator with the sheriff's office. Is that your program? I don't want to. It's a state funded program that can't that ended. So now we are transferring those grant funded positions. So we can still do it with GR. And do you handle it? Um, financial administrator, so yeah. Okay. So what's your name again? Sean Jernigan. So, so, Sean, if you don't know, just give us a report on it. I'm wondering what percentage of people are tested and what that number amounts to. And my staff told me they think it's 20% who are not tested. Uh, and if not, I want to figure out what we can do to encourage them to be tested. Okay. Well, this specific grant program is for the counselors. There's a little bit of testing involved, so I'd have to get back with you on that. That's right. the testing numbers. Okay. We're moving so fast today, I don't want to hold it up. I appreciate you. I think colleague had a question, Judge. Yes, Commissioner Kegel. It was on a different subject matter, but when I learned your name was Jernigan, yeah. you wouldn't be related to the musician Dennis Jernigan, would you? Oh, well, I hope so now, but no, I doubt it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had a different question or, or statement. Uh, Judge, we have a donation of three police canines, mm -hmm. and since you're in financial department, you can 
confirm this, the value of the dogs themselves is $30,000, but doesn't Canines for Cops also provide the training yes. that goes along with that? And that's yes, worth I think about it's 10? kind of baked into the $10,000 per, per canine. Uh, so that's in addition to the 10000 Yes, yeah, it's $10,000 total for the canine, and we price them that way or value them that way for the training that they get from Canines for Cops. Uh, so this is a pretty big deal, <laughs> and they donated them. Correct. So, Christy Scheller, if you're out there listening, thank you. Thank you. All right, Institute of Forensic Sciences. County Clerk. County Attorney. Uh, Judge? Yeah. Uh, Robert, uh, I remember that uh, we had... Um, I uh, can't remember, maybe it was about two, three months ago or, or longer, uh, that we took a action on identifying the county privacy officer. And I know that uh, uh, Mr. Likas is now retired. Uh, so who's, don't we need to vote on the privacy uh, we officer do. Now, again? Now, Mr. Likas doesn't retire till the end of February, mm -hmm. so we have some time okay. to, to accomplish that. All right. Thank you. And, and then, uh, I guess on item B, huh, what uh, what are we going to do about General Paxton? Uh, we, we will work with General Paxton in the court. Sometimes we're on his side and sometimes we're not. Mm -hmm. This relates to item B, and Rock Owens is here to explain in detail if you want to. And we can even go into an executive session if we want to get into legal strategy. But in general... What happened is earlier this year, this court authorized the county attorney in certain extraordinary circumstances to file litigation on environmental matters. Uh, in a particular case, in fact, this ExxonMobil case, uh, General Paxton's office has challenged the authority of this court to do that. In effect, they're saying the court has to act on each and every individual matter and you cannot do a general authorization. Now, we are dealing with that in the district courts here in Harris County and eventually a judge will tell us what the rules are. But for the time being, uh, we can, and we can certainly report whatever we need to to the commissioners on the details of that. Yes, Commissioner Ellis. So this is a safety net to go ahead and do an individual authorization. Uh, and, and, and you note that it's an alternative. We can either file a new lawsuit if we want to. We can file an amended the amendment to the pleadings. It's whatever works best for the lawyers who are actually handling the case and to move the case forward. Mr. So what's best for your legal strategy? Talk about this here. Oh, I know I have an item in executive session. Would you uh, prefer we talk? Probably your legal strategy would prefer doing it in an executive session. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd love to hear more about it as well. Certainly. And it'd be good to hear from Rock about the violations, though, if, if he could cover that And he's that here as and well. he's available. Great. So we'll take that up okay. um, later on. And so that was a county attorney, public defender, justice administration, travel and training, grants. Commissioner, I saw your item for the livable space. Yeah, I'm, up. I'm looking at it right now, Judge. Thank you for recognizing it. I'm excited, um, and uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, do some very critical work, so I'm very excited about this application we're submitting for our livable center yeah. uh, work for the Cloverleaf uh, project. That's beautiful. Exactly. Fiscal services and purchasing. I do want to discuss the jury assembly building on page 18, C1, but I'd rather take that to executive session, Dwight, if that's okay, so Whatever we can like. discuss the strategy. Uh, item 2A on page 18, I have here that we need to insert the word county before, county and, excuse me, insert county and before flood control. And then on 
page 20, item 12C, change the name of the company from IN McKean Inc. to LN McKean Incorporated. Uh, Your Honor, on that same item? Yes. McKean is not capitalized. Is the M supposed to not be capitalized? That's... Yes. That's the uh, the way they submitted their bid, so we basically put it that way. We can capitalize it or not as long as it's approved the same spelling. They submitted their bid with the small L and N and then McKean, so we we usually list it the same way. All right. So thank you. Uh, let's go back to this uh, jury assembly building. Do you want an executive session? Yes, because we're trying to decide, you know, the strategy with – FEMA and the current company, so I'd like to discuss it in executive. That said, obviously, the bigger point is uh, there's a commitment to get this done as quickly as we can do it, but I hesitate to say something uh, per the discussion we had last time that would hamper our negotiating if we're, position if we're with either the about, company or FEMA. Uh, you know, conferring with the county attorney, then it's, it is appropriate to go into executive session. Yes, and I'd like to do that with you guys. So... Unless well, you're folks talking about the county, you're going to give us legal opinions? <clears throat> We're going to exchange ideas relating to the pros and cons of, of proceeding in a certain way, and there are legal implications in that. Now, if we go beyond that, we'll have to come back and discuss those in public well, we would. session. We would. Okay. But uh, right now, I don't know exactly what the questions are, but it is appropriate to, okay. to go to the executive session. Thank you. So unless folks have other questions on purchasing, I'd like to hold off on getting to Commissioner's Court. The uh, FEMA Administrator Gaynor is on his way to meet, and so I'd like to take an early lunch, if that's all right, until uh, 1240. Thank you. Thank you.
said that. Uh, So how are we looking on the cameras? Oh, happy new year to you. Are we getting any uh, any bites? Okay. Uh, usually David's wife makes a bite. So does Barbara. I've never heard that complaint. <laughs> I thought you were maybe copying Commissioner Garcia. No, I could never grow. I could. I've tried. I used to have that when I was a young man. But, uh, you know. Yeah, I've never been able to get anything of any substantial growth until we're right here. I didn't even have a shape. My whole face was nearly 25. My, yeah. my son. Uh, I considered myself blessed for that. He can do this, but he can't do a muscle. Uh, he gets that from his grandpa on his mama's side, who's uh, from Cherokee. A lot of the Cherokees have a hard time. Oh, yeah. Nah. You were put all over you? His arm, nah. right? so I guess we're yeah, J.J. Watt, you know, I, I meant to be giving him a little extra grief, but I backed off. I felt like it was, I gave uh, him okay. that. Well, I miss how the perfect. He told me he only gets one more, uh, one more, one more week. I mean, one more week and he's gone. Did you just, did you call my name? Oh, no. J.J. Watt? No, no. Water boy. <laughs> hey, water boy. Shut down. Gatorade's better than water. <laughs> I love you, man. You take care of it. Keep us safe around here. I try, man. I try and open that door when they wouldn't let you in. I know, right? You want to see him lose his temper? Ask him where his key card is at. He said, well, I've never seen him get mad. We had, we had this new deputy up here, Mr. Rico Suave. Really, you know, he got an attitude. Right? And Dwight was trying to get in. <laughs> what did he tell you? Sir? You don't have a bag, you need to leave the facility. I'm like, okay. He I'm went here. bananas. He's like, I didn't know. Hey, man, what? Come on. Why don't you come down to the sixth floor and give me the same thing? No, I here? did not. I told you that. I just told him, well, did you come open the door I, for I me? I said, whoa, 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 I got it. Let me let Dwight in. You're so full of it. I said, this is my VIP guy right here. <laughs> you're so full of it. You know better than that. Nah, you're, you're a good guy. No, I didn't do it. You know, I, I, I exaggerated. <laughs> No, you, <laughs> the bull. I, I, I just, tell me it's not so. I figure we'd be back early. <laughs> Good, how you doing? Well, I could change on this. Here? Tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Right now, as of right now, he's just like the Judge, you threw me today. Lunch at 11:30. I didn't know because normally it's a snack at 12:30 and then lunch at 1:30. So you, you threw me there. B and C. B one, B two. Now don't forget my offer to help you with those wings now. So what are you gonna what are you gonna bet on the next one? Huh? I have my notes. No, I advise not to bet on the next one. But I do have a question for you. Where where is your favorite tamale place? Is there maybe where it was? 
All right, let's get started. It's 1246, and Commissioner's Court is back in session. Let's go back to public health. It looks like folks clarified the items that need to be approved subject to a review by the county attorney. It's page nine, pages 9 and 10. So I have here its items 7, B1, B2, B3, B4, and C1 and C2. Is that what you have? Uh, that's what I have, Judge. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. So those are all approved subject to review by the county attorney. And we were over at uh, Commissioner's Court. Yes. I, I did want to say on the public defender's office, yeah. I'm glad that they are, I don't need them out here, but I'm glad they're putting us in line with best practices. And uh, you, you just appointed me to that board, so I'm more than happy to go off. And I'm told that uh, colleague Commissioner Raddick said he was glad to maintain his perfect attendance. Never have him gone. <laughs> uh, but it does put us in line with, with what ought to be done as a best practice. Yeah, great. Thank you. So my item A is on uh, creating the Harris County African American Cultural Heritage Commission, and, and I need to change that on the agenda item uh, to change the word council to commission. And this is uh, something I'm really proud of, and, and, and that was came from the community, and I know some folks are here today. We're one of the most diverse counties as we discuss and as we tackle issues of, um, of justice and reform. We have to also 
look at our history and celebrating our history as part of the way in which we move forward. So I wanted to, to just hear from uh, the folks that are signed up to speak on this and explain to us what this commission is going to be about. So I've got here, and this it's, a, it's just a beautiful program because folks have come together from all across the county, from Piney Point to Barrett Station to Carvindale, of course, Fifth Ward, Third Ward, Acres Homes. Uh, it's really a countywide initiative, which is really exciting. So uh, Pamela Norman, Tanya DeBose, Deborah Sloan, Carl Davis, and Deborah Walker. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Tanya DeBose. And um, first of all, I want to say thank you again. Happy New Year, and thank you again for allowing us the opportunity to come before you today uh, to talk about the Harris County African American Cultural Heritage Commission. Um, this work that we've been doing to preserve uh, important cultural and historical uh, assets across the county are so key and important to who our identity is. We're seeing uh, rapid gentrification in our areas. We're seeing uh, cemeteries that have gone unnoticed. We're now finding out where they are, the research for the areas. We're just now starting on that. And so one of the things that's important about establishing this African American Cultural Heritage Commission is to serve kind of as an advisory uh, on issues that come up to verify claims of African American culture and heritage uh, across the county in every one of the precincts that the commissioners cover. There are places where African Americans settled after the Civil War, places people don't even know about. And our families came out of those areas. And what we want to be able to do is to be able to preserve some of that history, but also use it to inform the future so that people will know the contributions of African Americans in Harris County. And so I appreciate, Judge, today um, you allowing us to come and to stand before you and to share why this is important to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Judge. Yes. <coughs> Tanya. Mr. Bowles. Yes. Would you walk us through how, how you would like for this? I know the, the motion is going to be to send it to the legal department to come back with a recommendation. Yes. But you have some idea on funding. Uh, what is it you'd like to come out of this? Sure. So um, a lot of the work that we've been doing already has just been kind of individually on our own within our communities. What you see uh, here in the audience is you have people representing multiple communities across all of uh, the precincts. And what our vision is, Commissioner Ellis, is to have at least four commissioners that are uh, appointed by the county judge, um, and then also to have five, I call them at large, where it may be an archaeologist, it may be a researcher or a scholar who can actually complement the work of the commission, but also help us to verify uh, claims. And they would serve without compensation for a three to five year period, we would scatter it. And then also, uh, the, one of the main goals of the commission would be to do an inventory of cultural and historical assets within each, within, across Harris County. And once that inventory is done, to be able to come up with a plan to protect those things that are very, very important uh, to show the contribution of African Americans across the county. Great, thank you. Yes, oh, I thought you had a comment. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll go hear ahead. from, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Judge, in terms of, of that, I, I think that this is a great program that we need to do. I would like for us to be able to have each member of court to have somebody that's on there. Mm -hmm. I don't see Dr. Blaylock Sloan yet, um, but she's we've here. got some. I think, she's here. I think I saw her earlier. She had, her mother had an, an emergency, mm -hmm. so she's unable to be with us um, right now, but she is supportive of this, and I have letters oh, yeah. of support from, uh, I think the, they sent it to the county judge's office, so we have <coughs> letters of support from all of those people, including our council, our city council people. I'm a big fan of hers, and you pegged it to where there's just history that we are just now starting to uncover. Yes. And that's a picture of a monument there that uh, was put up in Precinct 4, where we, it was actually DeBose that started it. Mm -hmm. A county wow. employee by the name of DeBose. Go figure. Who put up a cross 
to commemorate mm -hmm. uh, slaves that had been buried in the back of the park. Wow. And we forgot all about it from the 70s all the way until recently mm -hmm. when and the, and the cross had been covered over by trees. Yes. And then when the trees died away, someone went by and said, what's a cross doing in a county park? Mm -hmm. And when we did the investigation, and Dr. Blaylock and Janet Wagner were the ones who helped us find out that that was a marker to commemorate the slaves who were buried in the back of the park in a cemetery that used to belong to the local Methodist uh, church. church that was there. Mm -hmm. And we would not have been able to have that but for the research. Right. So, I, no offense, but I'd like to have someone that I can put on there because we've got a lot of rich cultural type things yes. that we need to continue to explore yes. and to bring about in the county. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, and, and this all is asks for for something to come back uh, after the county attorney reviews it, and so I think that's a great idea, Commissioner, and we'll discuss it, obviously. I mean, part of the beauty of this is, is really been driven by you guys, yes. which is important, and it shows you, uh, you know, the, the meaning of community mobilization, and I think that'll lead to an even better result, and so we'll work with you guys and with the commissioner's offices to put together, you know, the best structure so that we can preserve the history and, and really build on the great ideas that, that you and, and the historical commission's mm -hmm. representation already will have so that we are respectful and, and celebrate the history in a way that helps us build a better future uh, and acknowledge sacrifices and contributions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Commissioner Reddick and then Commissioner Garcia. Whether I have a person <coughs> on the committee or not, um, the fact still remains Precinct 3 has taken over three cemeteries yes. that we maintain. I think you're aware of those. Yes, and thank so you. You find a cemetery that's not being taken care of, mm -hmm. meets the lot, what's already existing under state law, mm -hmm. we'll be there to help. Thank you so much. And Thank I mean you. that very sincerely. Thank you. Thank you. you every, everybody who I've talked to that's in your area said that you're very supportive of that work, and so thank you for that. You're very well. Definitely. Thank you, Judge. And I, was, I, I want to thank all of you who have been so supportive and adamant by uh, seeing this. And, Judge, I, I applaud you for moving this along because, you know, from my time uh, on city council mm -hmm. where I represented Independence Heights, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, last uh, incorporated slave city in Texas, and now I represent uh, Barrick Station. Yes. And so, uh, and if we don't do these types of things and uh, provide the leadership like you're doing, Judge, uh, then developers will be happy to build over history. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we'll lose it forever. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to do things to ensure that uh, these, uh, these icons are, are protected and, and, uh, and uh, supported mm -hmm. and, uh, and preserved. So thank you for the leadership you have all provided. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, yes. uh, but I'm excited about what the future brings. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, so, Tanya, <coughs> I, I mentioned to you when we chatted a little earlier, that it's a brilliant idea, but obviously at some point to turn it into fruition. Mm -hmm. In addition to the leadership of the judge and, and whatever comes back from the legal department, at some point we got to figure out how we fund it. Yes. And uh, I know when you and I chatted uh, with uh, Dr. Sloan, Blaylock mm -hmm. Sloan and others, I don't know, was that before Christmas, I guess? It was before Christmas. Mm -hmm. I, I asked where else was it happening, mm -hmm. and, and you all were going to look. I'm a, I think my staff shared this with you if they didn't, but I'm going to give it to the legal department. But so Alabama has the Alabama Black Heritage Council. Yes. I don't know what it's done, but they set it up in 84. Mm -hmm. Kentucky set up one in 94. Maryland, 07. Mm -hmm. North Carolina in 08. South Carolina in 93. Then they set up a commission in 01. Only a few counties have done it. New Hanover County in, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, set up one in, in May of 2019, mm -hmm. Asheville, North Carolina, Austin, uh, Texas has. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to you, some people have figured out how to turn this, and I think the phrase is uh, cultural tourism. Yes. So mm -hmm. in Montgomery, they figure out how you take the bus routes or walking yes. traffic, mm -hmm. hate to say it, bike trails, yes. like along the Underground Railroad, in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, so that there's a way to come up with funding to pay for it. And at some point, we ought to come up with some funding mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then you all ought to go to the city and see if they would put up some, uh, and, and maybe the state. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a cemetery earlier that I know you're going to talk to Commissioner Garcia about yeah. later. And trying to figure out on the state, if it's on parkland, it's easier for us to do it. If somebody claims it's their private land, mm -hmm. then we got to have a fight over, you know, how, how you get it. The mm -hmm. one you worry about that has a, a road going through it. Well, I think it's a brilliant idea, Judge, and I, I commend you for it. As you know, the, the county's going to pay to put those anti-lynching markers up over in front of the county courthouse. I think we're going to be unique, one of the few places where we do it in front of the county courthouse. Mm -hmm. I assume the city's going to put some funding in to go in the fourth ward. And, yes. And that may be declared a world, world heritage site. Mm -hmm. But at some point, we got to figure out, when you experts get together, how we pay for it. And, yes. uh, and I, I think on our part, with the judge stepping up on this, we ought to be willing to vote to put a little general revenue in the jump-starting it. And, and then hope other governmental entities will step up as well. But then at some point, by and large, you have to go to the philanthropic community or somehow figure out how it is a, if not a business model, a tourism model yes. to sustain it. Because I heard the previous speaker saying, before we do parks, <laughs> oh, yeah. roads, uh, uh, er, earlier when you when you had to report a turn, that, was not, that one's not in my precinct, but mm -hmm. I was saying the reporter just asked me about fixing up stuff in our park. Mm -hmm. And then she was asking, well, what about going over and taking care of that cemetery? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how about if I get a little additional revenue to do it? Uh, and usually people get quiet. But I think that is the challenge. And to make it press worthy, uh, but find out somewhere where people want to see it. The federal government has put some money up. Uh, I, I've seen that site in New York, mm -hmm. which that burial ground that was uncovered because the developer was yes. going to put a major building up. Turns out New York had the second largest slave, slave population in the country mm -hmm. uh, after Charleston, mm -hmm. which most people, which I didn't, which the government didn't know mm -hmm. until they unearthed that, uh, that slave cemetery in New yes. York. Mm -hmm. So good work. Yeah. Well, let's continue hearing from the speakers. Thank you so much. You're very thank welcome. You. Thank, thank you all. Any other speakers that I called up? Yeah, we have someone from Barrett Station and call from Third Ward. Go ahead, y'all. Yeah. Just state your name and affiliation for the record. Uh, Carl Davis uh, with Third Ward and the General Board of the AME Church. I stand here today on the shoulders of Bishop Richard Allen, a freed slave who founded the AME Church in 1787. I stand here today on the shoulders of fellow AMEs, Frederick Douglass, Rosa Parks, Reverend Oliver Brown, and the, who's the father of Linda Brown, that led the plaintiff of Brown versus the Board of Education. I also stand here today on the shoulders of a fellow Houstonian, Heman Sweat, who was a member of Wesley AME Church, located in the heart of Third Ward, who stood up during an NAACP meeting in the basement of the church and volunteered to be their representative to integrate University of Texas Law School. It was in October 1945, they later filed a suit, lawsuit, Sweat versus Painter, when he was denied admittance to that university that was argued by Justice Thurgood Marshall all the way to the Supreme Court. That meeting at Wesley sparked the passing of Texas Senate Bill 140 on March the 3rd, 1947, authorizing and funding the creation of Texas State University for Negroes as the first state university to be uh, located in Houston. The school was established to serve African Americans in Texas and offer fields of study comparable to those available to white Texans. I stand here today asking the commissioners of Harris County to establish the Harris County African American Culture and Heritage Commission to preserve, protect our historical resources that are part of our legacy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. Hello, I'm Sister Mama Sonia. The tray, the nickel, sunny side and acre shakers. I'm here to represent the tray. You see, I'm proudly wearing my Jack Yates jacket because when you cut me, I bleed crimson and gold. Today, I am asking you to establish this commission. There is so much history in Houston, 
When you look at the Park Theater, Emancipation Park, which was not the first black park, but the first park in Texas. Of course, we have Jack Yates. We have the Park Theater. We have the Black Panther shootout on top of St. John Church. There is so much heritage that's going on in this area, in Houston, Harris County, that people don't even know about. Last night, I was at a meeting where we were working on submission to the to, uh, TEA about the new curriculum to establish African American studies statewide. We need to know who we are. People who do not know where they come from are bound and are doomed for the future. I'm, I think this, this is so important because our children, we always say our children don't know who we are, but the sad thing is our adults don't know who we are. African American history, African American heritage is not just history for us, African Americans, it is your history too, because but for us, no one would be here. So I think it's so important that we establish this uh, commission. Uh, it needs to be uh, made up of teachers, it needs to be made up of people in the community, religious people, and we need to have some young people. There needs to be somebody from high school, even middle school, we have some very, very uh, strong, strong people in this in our community. So I think it's so important, please, 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 do this. You know, the, the Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. We're saying, do this in remembrance of all of our proud uh, uh, African Americans. So we can celebrate our, our, our forefathers, our foremothers, our history, and more importantly, our history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dolores Rogers, and I um, am delighted to be here to speak to you. I serve on the board of the Emancipation Economic Development Council, and uh, that council has responsibility for the Emancipation Avenue Main Street program, which is about uh, economic development and preservation of history and culture. And so this commission we believe is an important element in helping to generate um, tourism and leveraging and taking advantage of a growing segment in tourism, and that is African American tours and family reunions. And 90% of the family reunions, I've been told, are um, in, in this city are being done by African Americans. And when they come to our uh, county, uh, we want them to have a real picture of the history of what, of Afri what African Americans have done in our area. Um, we've had, we have five, uh, we have freedom colonies that been have been identified as endangered places um, in Texas. And so we want to make sure that uh, we do all we can to preserve those areas. So this, uh, this commission, I believe, would be uh, go a long way t in doing that. Um, and I would be remiss in saying that um, in addition to being a Main Street program, one of the only ones in Texas, the first, in fact, in an urban area, that um, my area, Third Ward, <coughs> Jack Yakes High School. Uh, we have over 16 churches with markers currently. Uh, we have over, um, oh, I'm going to say we have uh, 20 churches that are at least 100 years old in that area. And we have a lot of jewels, a lot of jewels in our community that have already been mentioned. But I believe the uh, preserving the history and culture in our county is an economic advantage that we need to take better advantage of. And I think a commission focusing on that and leveraging that history is very important. And so I bring with me letters of support from um, council member from District D, Carolyn Evans Shabazz, from the Urban Research Center of Texas Southern, uh, from Row House CDC, from the Shrine of the Black Madonna, and from Trinity East United Methodist Church in support of this item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Melody Fontenot. Um, I am a resident um, uh, from the community and representing the community of Barrett Station, uh, Texas. Uh, this community is, for those who may not have uh, heard of it, is uh, located uh, only 15, 20 minutes uh, east of downtown. And um, good afternoon to uh, the Honorable uh, Hidalgo and all the commissioners uh, in the court here. I would like to ask uh, your support for establishing the commission. And as you think about establishing the commission, I'd like for you to think about uh, historically African-American neighborhoods like the one that I am from. Not only am I um, from Barrett, but I am a Barrett descendant. Mm. My Simon Barrett, who is the father of Harrison Barrett, who is the one who purchased the acres from uh, Reuben White, mm. okay, back in 1874-ish. Um, uh, um, Simon Barrett is my great-great-grandfather. My mother is uh, Willie Barrett uh, Goodlow. So, I also am standing on the shoulders of my people. And um, our people from this community, um, we are not in uh, the city. We are located in the county. And uh, we've been there since about 1876. And uh, there are a lot of Barretts in Barrett Station. Um, as of uh, recent, however, say with the, uh, since the 2010 census, the demographics of our neighborhood is changing quite a bit, uh, just as is the city of Houston. Uh, and with that, we have a number of um, challenges that we face, OK? Um, it has to do with uh, property, where we are, you know, we're experiencing uh, property taxes increases like we've never seen before. Uh, basically, what we have is, um, you know, eyes on our town, our sleepy little town it had been of Barrett Station. So we, residents of Barrett, uh, see, um, you know, growth is a, is a really good thing, but we also want to make sure that we, it's critical now that we um, kind of tamp up our efforts in preserving um, our heritage. And the way we do that is to be a part, you know, of commissions such as the one that we're asking you to support. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Garcia has a comment for Ms. you. Ms. Fontenot, thank you so much for coming down, and uh, thank you for speaking up on behalf of the commission. Um, you know, again, the commission is critical because, uh, as you uh, touched on, you know, we here uh, had to work with the engineer's office to make sure that we had a policy uh, in the renaming of the plats that were taking place in Barrett because that's where some of the initial history was being erased. Um, and then uh, I'm, I'm glad that my office was able to help by putting up the, 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 the signs in, in Barrett. You. Yeah. Uh, so those are, yes. but those, that's just a, a drop in the bucket of what needs to, needs to happen because this history is so rich. Uh, and we just cannot, we cannot lose it. So thank you again. Thank you all uh, for being here to speak on this commission. Thank so you. important. Any other speakers? I have here Ed Jones as well. Good afternoon. Truly a blessing to be here. I'm the newly appointed pastor over at Woolwich African Methodist Episcopal Church over in the Carverdale area. Hmm. And I too like Davis. I'm also a son of Richard Allen. Just want to leave something with you. History is the study of the human past. The past of- Could you <coughs> restate your name and affiliation okay. for the record? I'm sorry, Reverend Ray A. Raleigh, pastor of Woolwich African Methodist Episcopal Church over in the Carverdale area. Thank you. Truly a, good, a blessing to be here. Just wanted to read something and share something with you. And I'm in uh, Woolwich African Methodist Episcopal Church is really in support of this commission. And amen. History is the study of the human past. The past has left many traditions, folk tales, and works of art, archaeology, objects, and books, and written records of our accomplishment. Historians have been recording the events of history since history. 
So I just stand to say we are in support of this commission, Woolridge African Methodist Episcopal Church. Thank you so much, Judge. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anybody else here to speak on the commission? Well, I do. I think uh, Commissioner Ellis mentioned there's an example in North Carolina, Kentucky. We'll be looking at all of those. And, and the intent is for this commission to help advise the court for the discussion how we may preserve and protect and celebrate uh, African American culture and history. So I look forward to seeing what we all come up with together. And we'll continue leaning on you guys. I mean, this is really needs to be driven by the different communities. It's, it means so much to see folks here from Carbondale and Barrett Station and Third Ward. And, um, and it, we just have such rich history all throughout the county. So I want to make my motion. Um, is there any other speakers, James? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Um, so, thank you. Okay, so the motion is for the county attorney to report back to the next court on uh, the feasibility of a Harris County African American Cultural Heritage Commission to advise commissioner's court in matters concerning the identification, recognition, and preservation of African American cultural heritage in the county. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And we'll work on the structure uh, at the staff mm -hmm. level uh, and with advice from the county attorney. Yes, ma'am. That'll be fine. We'll be pleased to do that. Okay. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good um, job, Judge. No, thank you. It, it was really all of you guys. Thank you all so much. All. I look forward to, to working together. Okay, so that was it for my... Um, for my items, uh, Commissioner Precinct 1. Precinct 2. Uh, thank you, Judge. Um, I've got an item here uh, related to Cigna Health Insurance Company. I know uh, Mr. Sword has uh, expressed some concern and maybe we should have this in uh, executive session. Uh, I, uh, and I just want to, to what extent should we, could we talk about this? Publicly versus being in an executive session. I, mean, uh, I, I don't think well, maybe Bill can talk better than I can about the details. But overall, you don't want to interfere or uh, cause a change in negotiations without careful thought to what you're doing. And, and so, I, I mean, that's, that's a very general statement, I know. But, uh, well, l let me, I, I'll let you be the, uh, the, the watchdog on this. I just want to first of all say that I put this item on the agenda uh, out of concern for our employees. We have a lot of employees that are part of uh, Cigna and a lot of uh, the employees are getting uh, care over at uh, Herman Memorial. And so obviously when I saw the news of, of the um, uh, separating uh, uh, of uh, relationship between Cigna and uh, Herman Memorial, I was concerned for our employees. Uh, because I want to make sure that uh, their treatment isn't uh, isn't interrupted to any any uh, to any extent, but also just to uh, talk as a county in terms of um, uh, the economics of what's happening within the healthcare industry and what uh, what precautions we ought to be uh, taking and and really what you know I know that this type of situation occurs uh, uh, in, in somewhat of a cycle. Uh, but, uh, but to that, to that extent, you know, Bill, you're, you're essentially uh, who these uh, type of uh, relationships uh, fall on Certainly. in terms of negotiating. Your thoughts on uh, how, you know, what does, what should this mean to our employees, number one? And then secondly, um, what should we be considering in terms of any legislation, if necessary, or uh, or just any other policy uh, considerations as we uh, make sure that our our uh, our health coverage for our employees is is intact? Sure. So let me kind of frame it up, and I, I the Sigma team is back in the back here, so they may be able to answer some general questions. If there's some more specific, we may need to uh, do executive sessions. So. Uh, the county is self-insured, 
but uses a uh, third party to handle all the claims, but also negotiate with all the doctors and hospitals and the, the medical providers. And uh, there are four majors. Uh, there's uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, uh, United, and Cigna. And so a few years ago, we went out uh, for bid on this and um, uh, been working with Cigna. And we have uh, about 17, 18,000 employees, but with all their dependents and, and all that. 40,000. 40,000. And um, Cigna, in, in their marketplace, they represent, in this Houston region, about 500,000 people. So we represent 7 or 8% of the pool that they're looking at. And one of the things that we pay them for is to go out and negotiate fair prices uh, with all these providers. And if they see a provider um, that they need to negotiate a little bit harder with because they're a little bit maybe out of line or whatever, that's their responsibility and that's their fiduciary responsibility that they do. So these negotiations happen all the time uh, with different providers. And if they see one that's not quite in, in line, then they will start new negotiations with them and open it up. And that's where we are with Memorial Hermann. Most of these things get settled way before the drop dead date, which in this case is March 1st. Um, I think that even one of their competitors, uh, United, uh, there's a billboard on I-10 right now that United uh, and Methodist couldn't get together. And so it's something that is kind of in the public realm. It's kind of interesting to me that this is the way the business works, but it is, it's just the facts of that. So as far as um, policies go um, that we are looking at um, internally, we are looking at um, probably uh, uh, our HR director uh, retired uh, at the end of last month. And we are looking, uh, as I talked to uh, several of you about, is finding someone in our organization. We have good help now, but we want to find somebody that can help us with that legislation and these other things. And then all, be really focused just on this medical benefit. We spend $300 million a year in claims. And that's a big number, and it's growing uh, significantly. And the medical uh, industry, it's just changing all the time. Um, one of the things that I'm very pleased with is I saw uh, last year that some of the pharmaceuticals, um, there were some uh, gaps or what I felt were some overcharges uh, with certain pharmaceuticals. So I worked with Cigna, and now we have it to where your main line like Walgreens and, and Walmart and all that, we've never had any issues with that, so we're going to focus in and make sure that we get it there were some of these outliers that they were way overcharging, in our opinion. So that's the general nature of the business that's there. We're going to, again, uh, on next court, I'm putting an item on there to tell you that we're going to go out and look for this job description and kind of isolate this group uh, in our department. And so that's where I am right now. And I do have the president here. Gotcha. And just, just uh, uh, one more question. To the extent, and I and I and I get it that business is business, and uh, and you have to, as, as uh, you alluded to, you have to make your own fiduciary, uh, uh, take your own fiduciary actions for on behalf of your own, your own, uh, your own stakeholders. But to the extent that a situation like the separation uh, with Herman Memorial uh, were to occur. Do we get heads up that there's a likelihood that this is going to happen or that it's going down that uh, that trail? We've had that conversation uh, last Friday and a little bit today that instead of just being reactive to this and saying, oh, my goodness, this may happen, that I want to develop with them and our team um, a way to keep employees informed <coughs> of this. Um, our charges at Memorial Hermann represent around $24 million last year of the $300 million. So we could be active in this and saying there are negotiations taking place. But really, this education that I just gave you, we probably need to tell it to all the employees mm -hmm. to understand that just because you're with this now doesn't mean that it couldn't change in the future. And that's just the supply and that. It's the economics of this are very, very. But look, medical costs, we know with this cap that we have, we can't be going up four or five, ten percent. Yeah. We need somebody like this to fight. And uh, and then the last last uh, uh, comment is, what do we anticipate to be the possible 
uh, impact towards Bentob and LBJ as a result of this separation? So um, it could be that people that th this puts more demand on our own hospital district. Um, my understanding is there's about 1,400 doctors right now that um, uh, basically refer people to the moral harm system. Some of those could be referred to the hospital district, although in those cases it could be that they're paying customers. That actually could help us out. And I would assume that there's a transition between, with the separation, that there's a transition for those receiving care at Herman Memorial to wherever they need to be referred to? Absolutely. And I don't know all the details on that, but that's one of my highest priorities to say, don't know if this will happen or not, but if it does, here's the information and here's a hotline you can call and we'll help you through that in working with our vendor. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. we do have one speaker, uh, and I also wanted to, I do want to say since they're here and, and, and Robert, it, to the extent that we need to discuss strategic direction that we're not able to do it in court, it, it would be worth discuss that we would have to discuss an executive session, correct? It would be better if we're getting down into particulars and strategies, that sort of thing. I think we ought to do that and, regardless. And also, and also yeah. to talk about the terms of the agreement that we have with Cigna and our legal obligations as a county. Yeah, so let's hear from uh, uh, Commissioner Ellis, uh, Commissioner Cable, and then so call up the speaker. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Sewitt, um, yeah. what can we not talk about in an executive session? And that'll, that'll help me decide okay. what I want to say yeah. here. I mean, executive session is designed for you folks to get uh, advice, counsel from your attorney, which is the county attorney. So that's, that's the parameters of executive session. Now, it is okay <coughs> to bring up ancillary issues that are necessary to discuss to get a full understanding from your attorney what your legal obligations <coughs> are. So it's pretty narrow. Very narrow. Yeah. That's right. So, so Judge, um, I think it's appropriate, Commissioner Garcia, for you to have brought it up because uh, I, I called Mr. Kester as well when I saw an article in the paper, and uh, he made the comment to me that it's fairly common when these negotiations are going on mm -hmm. for uh, both sides to do a little posturing. That's probably why they put billboards up. You, you, when, usually when you put those billboards up, you want to... You, you, you want somebody to call somebody and say, work this out. Mm -hmm. uh, you said the, the president of Cigna is here, someone from Cigna? Yes. So uh, I Mr. think Hickey, yes. yeah, he would have a sense of what he can say. So is that who signed up to speak? No. no. Or, or if he can speak, I want, I want to hear from him. I, I would say I know that this is always a competitive process between the big four, Blue Cross, Aetna, United, and Cigna. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously... You know, when this goes on, but, but each side's pressuring the other. But I will say that uh, if it did fall apart and I had all of these county employees calling me or anybody else at this table had them calling them, we'd certainly take that into account when it's being awarded again. So just there ought to be pressure on both sides. At the end of the day, I assume that uh, the hospitals are trying to make as much as they can make and the insurance carriers want to make as much as they can make, and the county has a, a, a interest in not having uh, claims at any higher than they have to be, because at the end of the day, taxpayers uh, and the, the county employees end up paying it. But uh, I, at the appropriate time, I certainly want to hear from the representative from Cigna, and I'm sure they'll decide just how far he can, Since they didn't they sign can decide up, how far they can speak publicly, yeah, and then yeah. if we want can, to, can they go in executive session? Yes, but I'm still limited on what I can say to them in there. Correct. And with them in there, I'm gonna have to get hauled out here in handcuffs <laughs> if I go across the line. I don't want to do that. I like the French cuffs. <laughs> so at the appropriate time, I'd like to hear from the person from whenever after my colleagues speak. But I just want to hear whatever Signa has to say. All right. I think Rack is slightly ahead of me. Refresh. It's fine. Judge, I just want you to know that the, uh, the hardworking staffs of Precinct 4 and of Precinct 2 reduced your workload. We were going to object to the format of possible action because we've learned that sometimes possible action can mean a lot of things as far as the imagination goes. Our staffs worked it out so you didn't have to make a ruling on an objection. 
Great. Thank I just wanted to compliment our staffs for working it out so as to uh, not have us have to bother you, Judge, on, on some objections. And when the time comes, I've got a similar compliment to your staff, too, that sent us over something saying that we weren't having to deal with serious issues on possible action. I'm glad you got health insurance. Yes, Commissioner. Um, I will not go into an executive session over this issue. We're self-insured, $300 million billings. This company was hired because they're experts. Their way they negotiate, their skills that they bring to the table to try to save taxpayers' money, the county money, it's really none of our business, the skills that they use. They're I look at it this way. We hired them because just because someone gets elected to county government doesn't mean they know anything about insurance, certainly not an expert, may not know about bridges, they may not know about a whole lot of things. So I'm just making it clear, this is a slippery slope to go down. Slippery slope. The taxpayers of Harris County have hundreds of millions at stake, and experts have been hired to negotiate for not only our employees, but for the taxpayers of Harris County. And I urge people to let the people do what they have the skill set to do. That's why we hired them, and we need to let them do their job without any inference, interference from Commissioner School. Thank so, you. So we have a, let me just call up uh, yeah. Glenn Van Slyke, if he was about. here. Do we have Glenn Van Slyke? Okay. All right. Yes, Commissioner. So then I, I want to bring up the person from uh, Cigna mm -hmm. to say, you know, I'm one of those people on, on the governing board. For my 36 years in public office, I've never believed I ought to be seen and not heard. Uh, so I, I'm sure that he can make a decision on just what he can talk about and what he cannot talk about. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ralph Holmes. I'm, I'm actually with you. I'm here today. Jim, I'm sorry. Jim is the uh, president of, of South Texas here in Houston. And... Um, I am the president of the region for Cigna, which we call the Southwest. My name is Ralph Holmes and, and Jim Hickey. So we'll be happy to answer your questions. Just like to say, I think number one, um, we are operating uh, as your fiduciary in your best interest. And with the places I grew up in, you, you have to fight for what you, what you deserve to get. 85% of our business is Cigna. Our customers are self-insured. That means it's your money. So we are working for you. We're working for the taxpayers. Um, I do think sometimes, you know, these negotiations get a little tricky. They can get a little ugly. We've heard what people have said, you know, both sides posturing. Some of that happens. You know, both, both of the entities want the right thing to happen. Uh, we do have a skill set with this, and we've done it before. We just finished a negotiation with Texas Health. In Dallas, we had a similar thing going on, but we, we worked through it and we got it done. We have enough time to get it done. Unfortunately, uh, we've tried, and Jim has tried valiantly through many meetings to get movement, and he hasn't been able to get movement from Memorial. So this is the next step in the process, but this is a process that we've executed across the country and, and in Texas before. Um, Every now and then you have a termination, but it's rare. So, if, if, if I might, uh, how just has there ever been a termination in Texas? I'm sorry, say H again. Have you ever had a termination in Texas? Um, I'm going to say no. In the time, that, probably in the last ten years, we have not. Okay. Yeah, we did. We had we. I want to answer your question the right way. So I mean, when you public, asked, did we have a termination, yeah. I'm assuming you mean a termination where we actually did split? Yes. Uh, we have not as of yet. Okay. I, would not, I would not take that and say, well, that means they're not going to have a termination. Because these things are, you're never sure. If you're buying a house, you walk away, you're never sure the two parties are going to come back together. 
But in most cases, it's in the best interest of both of us to come back together. Okay. And of course, I think you it's all the best have the of Memorial. Yeah. It's also in the best interest of Sigma. Yeah. In terms of governmental entities here, you have the county, the city, you have the larger school districts as well. Uh, just a county. We do not city? have HISD at this point. We did. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yes, Commissioner. Th thank you all for coming down. And <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's interfering with you, uh, but uh, I appreciate you all coming down and, and sharing uh, uh, what you can with us. And just simply to tell you that, uh, you know, I, I care about my staff. And uh, when they're calling, asking, you know, questions about uh, what, what does this mean to them, you know, you've got to be responsive. Uh, so I appreciate you all taking time to join us. Uh, just, and I'll just say this, I mean, just so you know, this is not a comfortable process for us either. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that I think both parties go through. It's just a necessary part of business. And unfortunately, I mean, Jim has a lot of the detail, but unfortunately, some t in some cases, we feel we're getting too far out of the main range of where our pricing should be, and that's when we have to go in and dig deep, and that's what we're doing. Thank but we you have enough time, uh, yeah. March, I think, 16th. March uh, so we have plenty of time to get this done, but again, we're working with an entity that hasn't wanted to budge. We can't. We haven't been able to get them to budge. So that's why we're getting to this Thank point. You Thank and, you, guys. Thank you. And Commissioner for raising J this. Just if, might, yes. if, if there's anything else that you want to share, I want to let you do it. I prefer to ask now, and I, I hope Mr. Hickey and Mr. Holmes, you can well, appreciate that, well, uh, then, uh, then, if, then if you did have to walk, and then we'd be asking. Sure. So, so some of the questions that were asked, let me address some of the questions that were asked before we came down. So one, um, we have been... Don't go beyond what you feel comfortable with. Yes, no, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm right with you. So, so we have been working with the provider groups, our provider partners, um, who you know, we have very close relationships with. And there's 80% of all the members affected are in two groups. These groups are actively reaching out to county employees now that may have some transition of care that needs to happen and making that happen. Um, there was an ask on Bentob Hospital, just to give you some numbers to let you know the breadth of the network we provide you. Um, should Memorial Hermann actually leave, worst case scenario, um, there would still be 3,613 primary care physicians in the network. There would be 18,399 specialists in the network. And there would be 72 hospitals, including Bentob, in the network. So it is a very large network we have. Um, you know, we have very good relationships with all our other partners. Um, you know, what has happened over several years with Memorial Hermann has resulted in, again, you are now paying, you know, your employees are paying, you're paying, the taxpayers are paying what I consider to be a premium that is excessive in the market. No one voluntarily comes and says, hey, cut my pay. So, of course, we've been trying for over 12 months to get them to have a good faith discussion with us. The termination, unfortunately, is a tool we're using now to bring them to the table. Well, and, and, yeah. I'll, and I'll say, Memorial Herman sued the hell out of us a few years ago. I'm aware of that. And I was involved in that mediation. And basically, we took them to come to the table and settle with us. We only pay $300,000 for attorney fees instead of millions of dollars. And what it boiled down to is because they put people that were under the quote, the custody of the sheriff, even if they were shot by a Pasadena policeman or whatever, they put them on a life flight and they'd fly them into Memorial Hermann Medical, down at Medical Center. And then instead of pushing them on a gurney in the Bentov Hospital, they wanted to keep them and planned on charging us a whole bunch of money. It didn't work. And what I told them in the mediation is, you either settle or we're getting life flight helicopters. Oh, two days later they settled. And recently, last year, am I right? On that million dollars to the care that they had settled? What did you find out? Well, this is altered. Your mic's off. I don't have. I don't have a firm recollection of the numbers, but 
I remember we did look into that, that we have this ongoing agreement with Memorial Hermit that up to a certain settlement. amount settlement. and then beyond. And that's from that settlement. But beyond that, I don't no, trust sure. my recollection. Okay, fine. Anyway, we questioned how much they were charging. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys, and it is it is uh, disappointing that that something as as fundamental as healthcare uh, can be victim to these kinds of negotiations, and and uh, to the extent that we, there are issues that we can only discuss, we'll put this on the list as well to see if there's okay. any additional support that any of us can provide in this process. Thank you guys thank so you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Commissioner Precinct Two. Anything else? I have, um, oh, uh, I'll move on to the other items. Precinct three. Mm -hmm. Motion. Well, have we have we gone back to the health department yet? Yes. Okay, good. We did. All right, fine. All right, motion. Precinct four. Motion. Miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, hey. Emergency and supplemental items. Uh, the first is uh, some CIP projects that had been held up. Uh, item number two on the supplemental agenda is Precinct 1. So, um, Chesh, when we had the item that come up involve, involving uh, financing for Harris Health two weeks ago, and I asked a question about minority and women-owned firms being involved in the Underwriters Council, the person here from Harris Health didn't have an answer, and, and Mr. Seward uh, uh, didn't, uh, maybe I should have asked you, so I was wondering who picked the law firm, and it uh, prompted me to wonder whether or not Harris Health was included under the disparity study, and uh, from talking to purchasing, they were not. I, I thought they were. And can you just, Mr. Dobson, bring us back up to date on uh, why they weren't included? You told me earlier. Uh, it was going to, back when, what well, short of it is when precinct one had to pay for it, you, you told me it was going to cost more than I wanted to pay. Uh, yeah. And yeah. and so we back, but I want to figure out how to, what is the process so that they would be included or if there's a need for them to be included. I know when I talked to one member of the board, she thought we did all of that purchasing. So I don't know how, how much more it would cost, how difficult it would be so that they too will make sure that we uh, know what percentage of the business that they transact goes to minority and women-owned businesses, and if there are any hurdles, any barriers to participation. Okay. We, currently, I've had a discussion with the uh, contractor consult, uh, collect home associates, and we can go back and pull the information. We did not include the original, like you said, because the original was just for the county uh, portion of the money being spent on the general fund. Cause Initially, it was going to cost 600000 and you were going to fund it, and we did not include the entire Harris Health System because of the number of contracts they have. Um, we can now go back. We do do procurement for both groups. Um, we can go back to Harris Health side. So we do all of their procurement? Yes, sir. Okay. Except so I didn't know. I thought maybe they did some and we did some. No, so we do all their procurement, but we do it's a different entity. So we do them. I have two groups, one that does Harris Health and one that does the county, and they're separated, but they're funded separately. So we did not include the funding for Harris Health procurement, I mean, their Harris Health uh, disparity study. We did not include that in the county portion because it had been a lot larger task. So in discussion we had with your staff early on, we focused on the county. Uh, we do have the ability to go back full records and look at that and provide that to uh, this associate and include them. So uh, I'd like for you to come back hopefully at the next court with a, re a recommendation on uh, if it needs to be done. Okay. So maybe with the disparity study that I think is going to be on the agenda in February, right. uh, at least the, the first draft will come to us, I guess come to our offices first, then at some point we'll put it on the agenda to decide to adopt it or not. Maybe they don't need to do it. I, I know with the city of Houston years ago, uh, the way the law worked, they piggybacked, if that's the phrase, off of the state's disparity study back in 93 or 95. And then when they were threatened with a lawsuit, eventually they had to do their own disparity studies. And then what we did with this one was piggyback. Or we did an interlocal agreement. We did an interlocal and did our own contract. With the city to do our own contract. 
So now, obviously, if there was a need to go do another full-blown process, uh, if it was going to cost that much, you, you make a decision and make a recommendation, okay. hopefully, and bring it back to court in the next couple of weeks, because if it could just be part of that contract for minimal cost, and it can be done quickly, uh, I'd like to well, consider that when we, when we do the whole thing. I think we need to look at also a lot of the procurement that we do through the, the premier organization, which is part of Harris Health. That area I need to look at and see if that can be included. That's a lot of that's commodity driven. So we need and to it may not work. Sometimes. I mean, sometimes it, it may it's not commodities. Work for this portion. This yeah. may be our services that we procure and bid out. We can include that portion, but the actual cooperative groups that they're a part of, a member of, that they're also their foundations a part of, that they get reimbursed on some of the. And that's separate. That would not separate, apply. Yes, and so I think even even the folks who do disparity studies would, would say right. that some places where it's just not fit. But if the city did it some time ago, now Metro, right. there are three different people doing disparity studies uh, in town. Uh, we did it with the city. Uh, and uh, the port, of course, is doing one now. And Metro is doing one. I don't want to I don't want to have uh, sort of led the effort to push it. Metro and uh, the port, and then come back and find out we didn't do everything that the county controls. Well, we could still, I think that Harris Health has already been uh, open minded, and if we do their procurement, we, we go down a path that this is the way we're going to do procurement for the county, it's going to be the same for Harris Health. So, because it will be awkward, I assume, if you got this one pot and right. you're going through this and you're doing all that procurement, unless you're going through the commodity sector, where there's right. probably not much of a role. Um, well, either way, the, the process is going to be the same. The county comes up with a process of we're going to procure with these requirements of so much small business or whatever the case might be, then the Harris Health will follow that same suit because we're going to do their procurement. And I make this item broad enough for the toll road just because I didn't know. But yes, the toll sir. road is included. Yes, sir. I verified through all the, the previous documents that we've included. In. Now, we don't have anything else I'm missing. No, sir. Do we? So my motion would be that you come back with a recommendation to us on whatever you think is appropriate, and this court decide whether or not they want to support it, so if, if you can, in two weeks. I'd like to say yeah. Her report, you should have a report. I'm sorry? Her report was supposed to be to you on October 31st. We had a delay in the fact that the contractors wouldn't respond, so there was a delay that the scope changed. I mean, the uh, schedule changed due to the contractors themselves not responding back to them. They refused to respond. A lot of them did, so we had to work through additional two months of additional calls to the vendor to get information. So that's why the report's not here yet. It'll be here in February. Thank you. Yes. And, and Judge, mm -hmm. oh, I, I do want to thank you for working with them in engineering and the county attorney's office and uh, Mr. Jackson so that they would respond. I think it would have been pretty embarrassing to think third largest county in the country, uh, most of the other, the larger counties, most of the urban counties in the country have done one outside Texas, but we hadn't done one. Some have in Texas. Travis County certainly has done it. Dallas County has. Uh, and, and I would hope when it comes back, it's a pretty big deal, Judge. We ought to consider it's going to take a bit of time. I want to make sure that we understand it. And then the next step, uh, hopefully we don't have to wait until this office is created, is how you implement it. But I, I know when we went through it, the assumption by some of my colleagues was our numbers for minority and women-owned firms were better than the city's numbers. It may be true. Uh, I was just told that we didn't collect them when I got here, so I just didn't want to. I remember jokingly saying, well, how could we not know? Russians know what the numbers are, so we, we will know. Right. Okay? Yeah, we'll, we'll have to work on that with the contractor. And get back. Okay. My numbers were better than yours, though. Well, well, everything about you is better. See, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Get along. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on my negotiating team. That'd be good. Yeah. Well, you but know, it'll be good to know what the numbers are for African Americans, Hispanics, African American women, Hispanic women, Asian Americans, everybody. It's just good to lay all cards on the table. And not just what commissioners control, because there's a lot more money around here being spent than just that money. But we'll know. That's the good thing about being transparent. Judge. Yep. Yes, Commissioner Garcia, and then oh, Commissioner Cable. Yeah, and and uh, I I appreciate uh, Commissioner Ellis. Uh, you continue uh, uh, to stay on this this item. I think this is going to be um, a game changer, if you will, once it's all complete. But uh, you know, one of the outputs that I'm looking uh, from this is not so much the firms, the number of firms 
that may be women or minority owned that we're doing business with, but really how much money is being spent with those firms. Yeah. And so uh, Radic may have a bunch of firms that he's working with and may be outperforming you. The question is how much money is really going back to the community through those firms. That's the real output. Well, and most of the firm, most of the money that uh, the hubs make, the minority and women-owned businesses, really is a subcontractor work, like on that billion-dollar bridge, as an example. But it'll it'll be good where it's all out there. We know. I mean, that's power knowledge. Yeah. Judge Deco, the thoughts that we're in the third largest county, and I happen to represent uh, a fourth, a little bit more than a fourth of the population of the third largest county, and this entity hasn't talk to us. We really would like to engage with them if we're engaged in such a big process. And so I'm glad to hear reports coming from my colleagues. But if they watch, it sure would be nice that they would contact us and let us engage with them. But Judge, if I, if I might, uh, what they were doing, we Commissioner, was talking to the folks who got to work. You know, not your office, because your office was not doing the work. We, we take credit for the work, but we would, the contracts are awarded to somebody. So I think it's sort of like reconstructing tax returns. I think, uh, and help me if I'm right, Wayne, it's over a five-year period. They go so back, and over the last five years, like reconstructing tax returns to go and see what was done over a five-year period from when it was awarded in 20. 18. It looks at all the money being spent to the prime contractors, the subcontractors. Yeah. That so I don't think there was any reason to talk to commissioners. They were talking to folks who got to work. And when they talked to me, it's because I would call and ask, how's it coming? Or do you have any problems? Uh, which is how we found out some of the contractors were not responding. And then after some prodding, one in particular that I called just didn't know. It was on some staffer's desk. Uh, he did not know that the request had come in. Okay. So the motion was that we directed you you bring something back to us with whatever you think makes sense and we can decide whether or not we want to proceed. Is that clear for you, James? Yeah. All right. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Aye. All right. And Commissioner, I'm sure if you have questions for them that Dwight can connect them, correct? All right, uh, next item, Commissioner uh, Ellis. The next item, Judge, is for a discussion on uh, the county's authority to enforce, enforce state-issued permits of uh, concrete batch plants, such as the proposed plant in Acres Home, among other industrial sites. I want to thank Mayor Turner. I know that was a press conference he invited uh, some of us to while we were meeting this morning, so we couldn't go, but I heard he had some nice things to say about all of the commissioners. My glass for the transcript uh, <laughs> of it. But I think I want to start off by asking the county attorney, and then uh, environmental people may come up. So I want to ask the, the, the city, city attorney's office, what authority does the county have in the enforcement of state issue permits in the unincorporated area as well as in the city limits? And also, what can uh, the city or the county, for that matter, do in its enforcement strategy uh, that the state's not doing? And the third question is, what would initiate conducting a basic inspection of a facility? Could we develop an initiative through pollution control where we conduct uh, routine inspections on facilities that have a record of violating permit terms? Uh, managing Attorney Sarah Utley is here and she's prepared to respond to those questions. And I also think uh, uh, Dr. Babbin from Pollution Control is here to help with that too. Good afternoon, uh, Sarah Utley from the County Attorney's Office. I can and Sarah, could you walk through a little bit so they understand it, I, I, in case somebody's watching, I mean, sure. what these plants do, sort of what the complaint is. I, I know every time somebody from my office calls, you're real nice and you meet with them, and when they come down and testify, but just walk us through the issue a bit. So, um, with, with respect to the concrete batch plant issue, um, as we all know, there's a lot of them that are popping up all over Harris County. And the process to getting those permitted, TCEQ issues those permits relatively easy. They have a standard permit that the TCEQ allows authorization under. And for those permits in particular, 
local governments such as Harris County cannot seek party status if we're concerned that the permit or the applicant is not going to meet the standards in the law. We do not have the authority to seek party status to challenge that permit or ask for additional permit requirements. And so often those permits are just, they're, they're issued. And they, they cause a lot of problems in the communities that they are located within from dust nuisances to not complying with their permits. And so I think the question is, for purposes of countywide, whether it's inside the city or in the unincorporated area, what is the authority of Harris County and Harris County Pollution Control to, number one, go in those facilities and conduct inspections, and number two, if we find violations, what are our, what are our remedies? Pollution control has the same authority as the state of Texas, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, to enter into these facilities to conduct monitoring of um, air emissions while they're on site during an investigation, as well as check for compliance of the permits and the TCQ rules under the Texas Clean Air Act. If they find a violation of either the state-issued permit or the Texas law that the TCQ has issued there under, we do have the authority upon approval of Harris County Commissioner's Court to file a suit in district court and seek an injunction to require compliance with the law. If we can only go after them for civil penalties, is there any rationale where we could go after them, after them for something on a criminal basis? And the reason I ask is because I, the, the state sets the penalty, and I'm told that oftentimes the civil penalties are pretty low, and I'm wondering do some actors just decide, pay the penalty and keep doing what I'm doing? But that's why you're doing injunctive relief, right? So we do have the ability, you're right, to seek for, um, to seek civil penalties. And the penalty range is $50 a day to $25,000 a day per violation. Now the catch there is for any violations that occur after September 1st of 2017, the legislature requires us to give notice to the TCQ and the Attorney General's office, and they can take the penalty and you know, choose to resolve it administratively, or they can take it in the district court action that we have filed, and then they get to control, you know, 100% of how much penalties assessed. So we really focus on the injunctive side of trying to make sure that these facilities come into compliance when we file suit, because it is a way to, you know, force the companies to spend money on compliance, because otherwise they can just kind of factor in the non-compliance into into doing business. Have we pursued the injunctive remedy on anyone? Um, for concrete batch plants, we have not had a case. So if we find a test case, you ready to, you, what would you need to, I, I know of some, so <laughs> what do you think? So the state has essentially neutered the statute on the civil side. They've made it very, very difficult for local governments to pursue environmental enforcement. Okay. So on the injunctive side, what resources would you need or do you have the resources Maybe Dr. I working think that's with Dr. A question maybe to for figure out. And, and working with the city, obviously, because this will be, you know, if anybody in the state has taken an injunctive route on one of these. I do not know that's a good question, but we can look into it and see if they filed in district court or if they've done an administrative action. Just because it may give us some, some guide. And we can look at several things from whether they're creating a, what we call a statutory condition of um, air pollution, which is basically like nuisance. You're impairing the ability of somebody to enjoy their property or they're causing health impacts. We have that violation and then we can just straight up pursue, you know, they're not keeping their records or they're um, operating equipment incorrectly. We, there are a lot of avenues to enforcement. But and, and are y'all talking to the city? So maybe it has an intergovernmental approach. So find the best case to go after, whether it's in the city limits, outside the city limits, because you don't you, you, you don't want to fail when you go after one. I'll let maybe um, Dr. Babin take over the investigation approach. Good afternoon, commissioners and Judge Hidalgo. <coughs> Previously, we had not really gone into the city of Houston a lot. My predecessor did not um, want to uh, disrespect the jurisdiction of the city. But um, as I indicated, I think it was maybe September, October, that we are looking at new initiatives. And one of the new initiatives that we're looking at is to investigate a little more fervently these concrete batch facilities. So as Sarah indicated, we will be looking at not only their record keeping, but we will be looking at uh, some of their NSR abilities, if they have an NSR permit, or if they have um, a standard operation permit, we may be able to go through the air pollution 
condition of air pollution, where if, if they're causing any type of nuisance, we can go that way. Um, we also have the ability now with some of the monitoring that we're purchasing to place a monitor, a low cost monitor in an area near the facility to look at maybe when the wind direction changes, how that might be affecting the residents. And we could use that to better support nuisance. Do you, do you know that more in the city limits are in unincorporated? To my knowledge, most of them are within the city limits, but I can get that information for you more specifically at a later date. Anything you need from us to find a test case to go after? And obviously you'll work with the city. I'm assuming you can figure it out. Either you do it jointly. I obviously would be awkward if of the three governmental entities that have enforcement power under state rules, if one said it's fine, that doesn't help your case. If two say it's fine, it's a real uphill climb. So at least the two local ones, we want to be in sync. It would make sense to me. I, I, you know, without commenting on how strong the enforcement uh, interest is on the state level, uh, there's a reason why somebody went and got the, the statute neutered. They, they were thinking that it was easier somewhere else. Whether it is or not, I don't know. We will seek to join forces with the city of Houston to move, move more uh, impactfully on these situations. And I assume you probably had somebody at the press conference. I had a staffer there, but I haven't found out what, what went on. Other I did have someone there. I haven't had a chance to really engage with them in the conversation. We do have um, an opportunity to talk after court, and I can provide information to you later. Is uh, the funding that you guys received as part of the gap analysis enough to allow you to go go uh, after these concrete batch plants that aren't uh, following the, the rules and regulations, or do you need additional support? I made an assumption that it might be, but now that I'm looking at how prolific this is, we may need to have a little bit more funding to um, engage a few more investigators at the level that would go out and do the inspections to make sure that this happens proactively. Okay, well keep us posted and through Bill as well, and maybe that's on time for budget. Uh, that would probably be ideal, and otherwise we can revisit. Uh, but I'm glad you guys had been looking at this, and it's just so refreshing to see that creativity on the injunctive relief. If that's the only way we can do it, we'll go up and around a wall. So I appreciate your guys' leading and, that. And, and Judge, I, I, you know, at least from talking to the mayor, uh, I, I think they want to be very aggressive as well. So I'd look for the right one, and to the extent we can team up, we ought to do it. But we ought to... We are, that's the key, find the right test case, a good one, and I think it sends a signal out, and I think it'll have an impact. I agree. Now, I know my staff met with you, and I didn't get a chance. Did I forget anything they wanted me to ask? Anything you want to add? I think, I think you hit the highlights. Okay. I think so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The other item I have, Judge, I think it would be appropriate to, uh, since there's litigation around, talk about that in executive session. That'll be fine. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, item six and uh, seven are precinct two items. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, number one, uh, have a conversation about uh, requiring committees. We've got a lot of committees floating around this place, and I just uh, want to make sure that, you know, we are not just creating them and then forgetting about them, and, and nor are, do we have committees that are just meeting to meet and but not getting anything done. So I am uh, proposing a motion that would read, uh, move to order all committees in the county to submit a report by January 28th, 2020, to the county judge and commissioners detailing activities in 2019, and that committees not submitting reports by that date be terminated, requiring reauthorization by this court to meet again. For the purpose of this motion, a committee shall be any group that meets under the auspices of county government in which more than one county department is represented and fewer than 50% of the members or invitees to the committee are representatives of commissioner's uh, court offices. Um, and then, you know, uh, we have to, I think, establish when we create these committees because essentially we create them with a, uh, a particular focus or um, uh, project in mind and to provide some, uh, some degree of sunset provisions for the committees. 
make sure that they meet, we, they're created, meet, get the job done, and then uh, let's fold the tent to see if, uh, if they need to uh, go further. But I think it's important that, you know, we uh, do a little bit of an inventory on these right now. And we've provided a, uh, a template uh, to be dispersed so we can at least collect some degree of information for what uh, those committees look like that are in the county. That's my motion. I want to second it, and Commissioner, I want to add a slight addendum to it, or maybe a perfecting question, uh, to make sure that we got a list of all of them. Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't think any of us want to sunset something that we did at this table, and we forgot about it, and whoever was supposed to do it forgot about it, mm -hmm. but somebody was watching, and they remember it. Yep. Uh, so, and, and if... Two weeks? Is that right? Is that two yeah. weeks or three weeks? Two weeks. If two weeks is not, uh, not enough time, I want to say we give them that, uh, that first meeting in February so they have time to compile it. Uh, but I think it's a, an appropriate motion, Commissioner, because at times I wake up at uh, night, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, if I'm on a, uh, uh, my bike, and that thing you remember when you're, when you're riding that bicycle, and then I'll pull over to the side road and call somebody and ask, and they're shocked at my age. I say, didn't that come up? You know, sometimes it'll amaze them. I may not remember somebody's name, but I'll remember something perfectly. It'll come back. So I just want to make sure we don't inadvertently, including me, something that I asked for, you know, Mr. Doplos was telling me earlier, I didn't know the issue was money on that disparity study. And when my staff said it, I challenged them. But that's when I was spending it. Now, if I'd known y'all were going to pay for it, I'd have put it in there. Six months ago, I, but I did, I'd forgotten. So does that make sense? I, I support that uh, amendment. Yeah. So if two weeks is enough that they can pull it together, mm -hmm. fine. And they come back and tell us in two weeks. But if it takes longer to pull together all of these committees or find the notes or if there, somebody hand wrote them or text them or whatever, but I don't want us to inadvertently stop something that any one of us asked somebody to do uh, because the clock ticked on. I agree. Did I make that clear? Or should I try it again? So my friendly amendment to this motion was that they come up with a complete list of what they are when we sunset them. And that if two weeks is not enough time, make it the first court in February, which is almost four weeks. Okay. And Judge, before we vote, I'd like a little clarification on how we're defining committees. Um, we got a lot of little committees that are out there that are just what we appoint and put together. I want to make sure that we're not sunsetting a statutorily required committee or some other entity. And so I would add to the addition, subject to review by the county attorney's office, to make sure that we don't inadvertently sunset something we're required to have somewhere. And, and we're happy to look at that. I mean, I mean, from my point of view, if it's statutorily required, then that's it's not be sunset it. But that's fine. It's a good idea to review all of these things at least once a year. I may be shocked at what all we've been asking. Right. Right. All right. Or what you we haven't been well, given. Okay. So, are, 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 do you yeah. accept that as a friendly amendment? Sure. All right. So, two friendly amendments. We have a motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And then uh, on um, my final item, uh, Judge, <clears throat> it is, um, I am so excited about the preliminary uh, report that's uh, being provided by the Harris County Homeless Task Force. And um, it is, um, uh, you know, this is one of those issues that I think uh, doesn't matter what person we represent, we're always getting some challenges on homelessness uh, throughout the area. And, um, and uh, it is one of those issues that, that uh, really, I think, uh, defines whether folks want to continue to call some areas of the county home or find somewhere where they can escape homelessness just to find that they can't. And so I think we, uh, we're doing a lot of good work. The, the, uh, the task force has really been doing some, some phenomenal work. So I've got a report. I believe that report's been provided uh, to everyone. So number one, I want to accept that report, but I also want to make a motion um, that one, we move to accept the update uh, of the homeless task force and 
to authorize the engineering department to conduct a feasibility uh, study of, of the Little Baker facility. There's a number of uh, counties and cities, uh, a judge, that have converted their jail facilities into um, uh, transition facilities, if you will. And it was a vision I had uh, when I first became sheriff in 2009. Uh, this court um, got uh, PGAL to do a feasibility study of one building, come back uh, with a report coming back that it cost $30 million to make the old county jail uh, user ready, which was basically uh, a hint that they didn't want to see this kind of project uh, get underway. Uh, but, it, but I think if we follow the lead of King County, uh, for example, in Washington, Alameda County in California, uh, Alameda County, rather, uh, Gainesville, Florida, uh, Albany County, Lorton, uh, Virginia, North London. Uh, there is, uh, these navigation centers are, have provided uh, so many positive results for the uh, surrounding communities. And then, um, you know, San Francisco opened uh, theirs in uh, 2015, the first one. Now they have four more throughout the city. And 50% of the customers found stable housing through the facilities. Crime dropped in the neighborhoods surrounding three of the four centers since opening. And, uh, and it has uh, the opportunity to provide effective interaction between uh, the criminal justice system and the, uh, and the uh, issues of homelessness uh, and those that uh, are impacted by it. In the U.S., 15% of the incarcerated people were homeless immediately uh, before uh, being, uh, or, or rather, were uh, uh, homeless immediately before. And then half of the people experiencing homelessness, uh, as you might suspect, uh, have some degree of, or some aspect of a criminal history. So I think that it is uh, critical that we do this because uh, when you drive down the freeway and you see encampments uh, throughout the area, you go into city parks or county parks and you have uh, folks, uh, you know, uh, existing in uh, incredible conditions. But because of the point that they have a, an inordinate number, or no, rather an inordinate number have criminal histories, it makes sense that we should have a collaborative with the county jail as a way of, uh, of stemming the tide of those uh, coming into our community and finding uh, refuge under a bridge or under a, uh, or in the parks and things of that nature. So I'm excited about the work being done by the task force. I'll move to accept the report and then, uh, as mentioned, and to authorize the engineering department to conduct the feasibility of the use of the Little Baker facility. I'll second it. You know, I'd like to make a comment at the appropriate time. Yeah, Good. Commissioner. So, Commissioner, thank you for uh, for the motion. And I, I do want to say I appreciate you making the, the comment about permanent housing being such an important part of the solution. And at first blush, if, if it's sort of unsettling to someone to think about putting homeless people in what was a jail, it's important to point out you're talking about temporary housing and a navigation center because with so many folks who are out there on the street, they are being recycled from temporary housing. Oftentimes it's the jail or a shelter or a mental health facility. Many are veterans. Uh, so obviously a big part of it, and I'm glad you mentioned Alameda County, because California in part, uh, unfortunately as a result of lawsuits, are, are gonna spend a massive amount of money trying to figure out how to do something in terms of permanent housing and they're going to probably try some things uh, more than we'll try. We'll get to benefit from some of the experiments to see if it works, but I think it's all part of that issue we've talked about here a couple of times, most of the affordable housing being concentrated, whether it's in the city or in unincorporated Harris County, in Precinct 1, secondly in Precinct 2, mm -hmm. and these folks are everywhere now, mm -hmm. and we all have the NIMBY argument, uh, but I think things like removing that requirement while we get our, our colleagues in the legislature who unilaterally just stop even the discussion about affordable housing uh, when it's not required in the state law for them to do it will help. But the real long-term solution to this homeless problem here and all around the country 
uh, as you said, is getting these folks in permanent housing. And obviously, sometimes it's getting them the medication that they need mm -hmm. uh, so they don't keep even cycling out of permanent housing. And, and, uh, and if I could just uh, <clears throat> add, Commissioner, that I tell you what, there's, there's probably of the many news articles that I have read, um, there's probably none that touch me more than to see uh, incredible students who uh, are graduating at the top of their class, but who were homeless during their time as they were working through their studies and succeeded in spite of their conditions. And I think it's important for us to uh, be leaders in the conversation of what the many dimensions of homelessness because the NIMBY issue, as you touched on, it's a challenging one. And, um, and too often people associate affordable housing. Uh, we've tried to give it the name workforce housing because yeah. it's people who have jobs with, uh, and people confuse it with Section 8 housing, uh, mm -hmm. which is folks on the, on the more uh, challenging end of the spectrum. But I think it's so critical that we uh, give the communities confidence that uh, affordable housing is a good thing uh, throughout the county and uh, would encourage, uh, you know, a unified uh, effort in that regard because the jail isn't the place for folks and often many people who are homeless are only homeless by virtue of missing a paycheck. And, uh, and then we do have the challenge of, uh, of those with mental illness uh, that uh, creates a more uh, challenge uh, for their situation. Yes, Commissioner Cagle, then Commissioner Ellis. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Judge, I want to commend uh, Nutter, yep. Jim Nutter, for that report. We also have in our midst some folks who are assisting with the report from the community, and we have honored them before. This is from the Hope Center. Judge, and uh, we thank you for being here and spending the day to participate in this, and so I think that's really good, and uh, glad that, that that passion and effort that you're putting in is now being expressed here. Um, excuse, number three. Excuse, excuse me, Commissioner, if you, you mind, I'd love to have Jim come on up. Well, let me, yeah. Judge, can I just kind of finish my little comments? Sure. I mean, I'll just, I mean, yeah. continue, but I'd, I'd like to have him come up. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. That judge, yeah. Um, number three, Your Honor, uh, a passion. There he is. <laughs> Great. A, a passion, and and this is a road in our county that Commissioner Ellis, you and I share, is 1960, and a very good program that we have is the Sobering Center program, which is more in the downtown region which provides not just a relief for someone that is intoxicated, but it provides the processing on the back side to help people get assistance. Uh, and it also assists with our law enforcement. So instead of someone, when they have someone who is off of their meds or has a chemical problem or has an alcohol problem or some other type of issue that's there, they don't have to sit in the hospital with that individual off of their beat for hours until that individual gets treated, but they can take them to a sobering center, and it is a low-impact way of improving people's lives. And, and as with many things, it appears that doing the right thing and the humane thing is also the cheaper thing and costs less because it reduces the amount of expenditure that we have on the law enforcement resources and allows those people to be back on the street. And I happen to know that Hope Center is hoping that they can get uh, one of these type of facilities as well that would greatly benefit Commissioner Ellis, uh, you and I, uh, and our constituents that are out there to where if we can take people who are uh, in need and perhaps when they're drunk, they're breaking off people's windshield wipers off of 1960 or causing other problems along the way, we can get them into a sobering center to where they can receive some help, then we can stop the cycle and we can and, uh, and improve the safety of our streets. Uh, last point, Judge. Um, with all due respect to King County, I know how much we love them. They have the second worst homeless problem in the country. We should not be modeling our systems off of failed systems. We need to be looking at our own systems when we're trying to do something that's better. And I would respectfully urge that we don't look at King. I know we love them um, and, uh, and all, but, but I would respectfully urge that we not use the, uh, 
the worst case scenarios as what we need to move to. We need to see how they failed and come up with innovative, data-based, uh, appropriate mechanisms to where we can improve situations. And that's my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Ellis, did you have Did you hear my compliments of you when you were in the other room? I just heard Nutter, sir, and, and everybody pointing me at, at that point. I knew who I was, um, but I did not hear anything beyond that because I had to run the gauntlet getting from there to here. Um, but, I said but, good things about you, or about your report. I think it's a good, solid initial report. I'm working with really competent people, not only in the county, but also in the city. And for me, it's a great honor and a great privilege to be part of this effort. So I, I appreciate your words, but I need to share them around with all the people I'm working with. And I want to thank Court for this opportunity to be working on this project. It means a lot to my heart, and it has my whole adult life. These are, these are God's children. We need to find ways to take care of them. Jim, on, on a, and thank you for the, for the work on this, and I know so many different folks that are coming together through this and, and uh, through uh, um, the different homelessness initiatives. So that's a great start. I just have a couple comments. There's one, uh, I visited the JPC uh, a few months ago. As you guys look into sort of next steps, the conversations I had there, as you walk out, there's a re-entry section. And so there they connect you, you know, I asked them, well, what's the, what's the challenge? What's the biggest challenge here? And they said, for folks, especially folks who are homeless, um, and, and the problem is not that we need to put all these different resources under one roof. They're right here. They have, a, I'm sure you guys have visited there, so really nice. It's like a section when you walk out of the joint processing center where folks leaving the jail go through and there's all of these cubicles almost with different nonprofits that these folks can be connected to. The problem is that the nonprofits don't have enough capacity to support these folks. Same with mental health. We pick someone up, we divert them, they go to a temporary bed for 20 days, and then they're back out in the community. And so I just want to make sure that you're looking at this from that lens, that we don't build something that is another stop back to the bottom of the cycle, right? So if we're going to invest funds in something, making sure that it is the type of capacity building that we need to make meaningful difference as opposed to just adding one more layover to where it's, you know, jail, joint processing center, something else, street, back to jail, back to joint processing, mm -hmm. back to something else. So, I mean, maybe the funds need to go to housing or whatever, you know, permanent housing or per more robust mental health services. So that's just my point is to, and, the, and it's the same point I had even with the, you know, the tunnels that, that are being discussed on flood control and any issue is to not get hung up on one solution but what's the best way to solve this, and let's solve it that way. Maybe as you guys look at feasibility of, yes, the feasibility of this, but also is this actually the best solution? There is one best solution uh, that the data shows, and it really connects with uh, what Commissioner Ellis said. The thing that has made the most difference in this country is permanent supportive housing. And it's one of the reasons that, that Houston is one of the cities in this country that uh, many other cities have, 60 cities have come here to visit. And they've identified that what we're doing here is best practices. That our homeless population has gone down by more than 50% in the last seven years, while our population has gone up between 400 and 500,000 people. And a percentage of homeless people who are here is is, is re remarkable. Now, I want to say that with a great sense of celebration, but unless we continue that effort, we're going to be in lots of trouble. And the, what we're hearing right now um, in other leadership circles in this country is to move from housing first, which has been the number one tool, to housing ready. And that would be a great mistake, which allows us, which allows law enforcement to punish homelessness. Now, as much as that is the number one tool that data shows that makes the most difference, 
we need other tools as well. And I think this navigation center is, is, is one tool in the, in the toolbox. But we've always got to remember that the thing that's made the most difference is permanent supportive housing. In 1960, for every 100,000 people, we had 330 mental health beds. Right now, for 100,000 people, we have less than 20 beds. Mm -hmm. And we have got to invest in housing, we've got to invest in employment, and we've got to invest in much more robust mental health care. And, and those are the big tools, and we're looking at all those right now. Moving forward, there are, there are several primary committees. We're gonna come back to you with recommendations on how to prevent homelessness, how to manage it, because we're never gonna be able to eradicate it, and then how to reduce it. And the other committee is around Little Baker and having a feasibility study. Does this make sense? And what are the optics of that? What's the philosophy behind that? And we've also got Katie Short looking at a deep dive about what's the cost of homelessness. I think that we can show, and it's gonna be hard, that as expensive as it will be to take care of these people and to find a place for them, it is much more expensive to drive past them. It's not only more expensive financially, it's more expensive morally. And it erodes the character of a community that when we can't not take care of these people. I think Commissioner Garcia had some comments. Thank you, George. And uh, Jim, thank you. And, uh, and all the folks that uh, you've been working with. Major Lee, uh, in particular, I understand he was having, I think, some dental work and a little bit under the weather, so we he just even preferred coming to court rather than dental work, sir, but... Yeah, uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's almost the same uh, on some occasions. But, but no, I, I just really want to thank you for your effort. Uh, you've gotten us to a good place. This is a conversation that, uh, you know, um, government doesn't necessarily want to have, per se. I mean, but we got to have. We'd have uh, to. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a quality of life issue, and if you want to add... The, uh, the aspect of morality on it, uh, that's, it just makes it that much more uh, necessary that we tackle this um, and demonstrate that, um, that, we can, that we can do better. Uh, and look, the, you know, one of the things that I was uh, impressed by was when I became sheriff was going out into areas of unincorporated Harris County that, you know, had lots of uh, amenities, pastures, and things of that nature. But you did also have homelessness out there. It was just really uh, impressive, and it just made me realize that the, you know, we continue to be an urbanized area, and we have the challenges of, of an urban community. And, uh, and so I'm glad that, that we are uh, having this conversation, and I appreciate your leadership on this committee. And it'd be easy to just point. put it onto the city. So yeah. that, and that's what's so important about yep. what you're doing, exactly. leading commissioner and Jim. Uh, Commissioner Ellis had a comment. Mr. Nunn, I, I want to thank you uh, as well for the, the work that you do, and you've been doing it for many years. I watch you close up and as uh, from a distance over the years. Uh, I, I think it would be good, Commissioner uh, Judge, if at some point we sort of had a, a roundtable discussion. Of, I don't in Austin we'd call it like a public hearing, where we together uh, hear about the report and exchange ideas. You know, I think about at the end of the day, as is the case with most things that come on this table, you got to come up with money. If it's not new money, how you use resources you have. It's reallocation. And, uh, you know, in, in San Antonio, a lot of people have bragged about that model, mm -hmm. but it's very expensive. Uh, and in terms of maintaining it, uh, that, that center that they put together, you know, that, that's a, a real challenge to find a, some, some corporate entity that would step up and do that. But, you know, that in, in addition to us changing the focus here, so we've been sticking all of the housing in one place, my area. And, I, and look, I'll take it if it can go nowhere else. I'm, I'm glad to have it because it is a, a moral issue. But it's not quite right uh, to those people who, who need our help. But we got to look at how we leverage uh, transportation money because they got to find a way, whether it's mass transit, a trail, or something, workforce housing, you know, in an era of limited resources, can we take some of that metro property 
and use metro dollars to the extent they can to use some of those park and ride lots that nobody's parking on anymore mm. and put some housing on it. I mean, there are rules, I'm told, under uh, the federal transportation funding mechanisms where they could step up and help us pool resources uh, from various governmental entities and quasi-governmental entities. But I think it merits a, a roundtable discussion, you know, just to, to make sure that we end up all on the same page and see what ideas come out. And, you know, I know you're going to King County, my staff told me you're picking the time when I'll be trying to, you're going to look at the homeless while I'm trying mm -hmm. to make sure I'm not officeless. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I'll be going before March. Uh, but, uh, but I think it is good also to go and get ideas on what has worked in other places and failures they have had so we don't have to make the same mistakes again as they come here yes, to see what successes we've had. But I think as we keep growing, you know, we are lucky. This has been a place where the average homeless person looking for somewhere to go, they don't come here. You got me? And there's certainly communities in California. I haven't been homeless lately, but if I was, I'd be, you know, I, I think that that was, that was the land of opportunity as well until I got there. You got me? Uh, but I think it will catch us down the road. And as I go out riding these bayous and I see more and more people in remote areas under bridges and more diversity in the population of people I see out there. It's just, it, it's, it mm -hmm. really is sort of shocking. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. <laughs> OK, that's it, I, I believe, for executive, executive session. Oh, we had a motion and a, a second for that item. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And did we move the whole agenda? I need to make a motion. To move yes, that. let me pull the executive session items real quick. So we have uh, quite a few this court. Um, first, it's under county attorney, the uh, ExxonMobil item. Do we need to go on executive, into executive session for that? 15B? Lay it on no. there, just, do, you're right, Mrs. We, we don't, but okay. I'm, I'm happy to go there. To, uh, That's all right. Okay, so. Um, so I don't think we need to go in on that item. Um, on purchasing, there's a jury assembly building. Uh, so that's item uh, 20 C1 on page 18 uh, to discuss the details of, of a contract. Now, uh, precinct two on the Cigna cancellation of contract, page 22, item C2. We're done. Um, I would like to discuss oh, the strategy sure. just to see if there's anything that we missed, yeah. if that's okay. Um, and item uh, emergency, or excuse me, supplemental item number five on the county's potential liability uh, and uh, related to flood risks and development standards uh, going on to executive session on a legal question there. So those are the three items that we're pulling out. How about the actual executive session? Uh, and then do folks need to go back for the appointment of these folks to the Houston Ship Channel Security uh, District Board of Directors? And these are the names that it's, it's, it's kind of a, a formality for them to come through Commissioner's Court. These are the, the representatives that the other entities get to appoint. No, I'll move on. I'm all right. All right. Uh, what about the appointment of our Director of Veteran Services Department? All right. Judge, if, if you don't mind, I, I saw the colonel uh, downstairs excited to have him on board. Uh, let's, get, let's let this guy hit the ground running and, and uh, move forward. So I don't think we need to go back to that one. Move it. Yeah. Sorry. Is he here, Colonel uh, Lewis? He was here earlier. Yeah. Judge, there was a motion and a second. Yes. I'm ready. All right. Okay. Well, let, let's vote on, on both the executive session items. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? There motion carries. All right. Colonel. Colonel, congratulations. We just passed your, your motion. Thank you Welcome so very much. Up. Welcome aboard. I can't tell you how excited I am, and I want to say thank you very much to Harris County, A, for listening. Uh, I believe uh, Mr. Jason Williams here is going to be uh, my first employee that I'm going to get hired here as my uh, deputy director, and I'm really excited about that. I understand you've heard from him in the past here in the court. <laughs> a little uh, bit. A little <laughs> bit. So... Uh, be careful what you ask for, right? And now we get to go solve some of these challenges here. But I want to say thank you to the court.
uh, means a lot to me. Uh, I spent a lifetime uh, working, I put my hand in the air the first time when I was 17 years old. Uh, I've been working in this space uh, ever since, 29 year Air Force career. I look forward to uh, serving all the veterans here in Harris County uh, and bringing some best practices hopefully with us to include homeless yeah. veterans that you were just discussing. Yeah. Uh, very excited about doing that, but most of all, thank you for listening and thank you for providing uh, the resources to get this off the ground and, and run it. So I'm excited and I can't wait to get to work. And thank, thank you for sir. your service. Thank you, Worth thank doing, you. thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you both and congratulations. Congratulations, Jason. Okay, so let's go to executive session. Oh, let's do the agenda. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll the agenda. move the agenda. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Gen Motion carries. Yeah. Judge, if we could take up um, the supplemental item five first and then the quick legal questions on the jury room because I'm probably not going to want to be there for the Cigna discussion, just out of an extra abundance of caution on my part. Okay, so, sure. So um, I just, if we can hit the two to where I'm there and let it be clear that I'm, I'm really not wanting to be in executive session on that last on one. On Cigna. Okay, sounds great. We'll do that. Okay, so it's 2.34. And I was just going to remind you, Judge, you need to announce that you're going into executive session for consultation with the county attorney on the following items. Okay, and, so uh, we're going to executive session for consultation with the county attorney on item, uh, supplemental item five on um, Commissioner Precinct 2, item uh, two on page 22 and on purchasing item uh, C1 on page 18. It's 2.34. Thank you. Is that correct? Was that yes, sir. Thank you. Is mine the last? Uh, I kind of lost track. You know, you're the sickest commissioner. Uh, I lost track because Commissioner Cagle asked that to take a third quarter. So just show up and be ready. Is that everything else I can hear? Oh, there you go. Fifty-six dollars and five cents. Bill, I'm signing this document here about fifty-six dollars and five cents. Somebody owes me six bucks. Fifty-six dollars and five cents. Me personally? No, this is, this oh, is the official action as a precinct four commissioner with the millions of dollars elsewhere. Thirty-two million five hundred. Uh, on top of that, we're doing a $56 one. Just just wanted to make sure that you knew that we're paying attention to the smallest of things. Okay. Josh will handle that.
Jeremy He's doing well. I've only seen him, I think, once since uh, getting back. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, since you are here, did the judge get a chance to meet with uh, the female judge? Yes. Okay. I have no idea what they talk about. Oh, uh, you weren't in on that? No. Uh, she had asked us for a couple of things. We provided them to her late yesterday, so hopefully yeah. that was helpful. Um, you were in on that? NRCS, uh, not a specific point. authority. Yeah. Right. Um, that was our I believe she brought that up. Great. I think she talked about jury assembly also. Hey. And you cover it.
Not as a science project. As a science project, you could cut open firecrackers. Like you could cut them down.
then after I graduated, where I like, yeah, then I, so, but what's the point? In doing intermediate oh, okay. I think 
Okay, so it's it's three seventeen, eight see three seventeen. We're back from executive session, and it's no action in any of the items. Correct. Correct. And our lawyers told us not to talk to the Cigna folks on executive session, so we didn't. Correct. And that's all. Uh, speakers. We have Alex Iliskovic. And uh, Mir Garcia, Deidre Scott, Steve Williams, Jen Schmerling, Michael Hughes, and Jay Duplechain. Hi, commissioners and judge. My name is Jen Schmerling, and I am the deputy director of Environment Texas. We're a nonprofit advocate for clean air, clean water, and open spaces. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, I wanted to talk about ways that Harris County can lead on solar and other forms of renewable energy. Um, I believe that everyone has the right to access clean sources of energy that don't pollute their air and that don't add uh, carbon emissions to global warming. Um, and as you all know, in the past year, our region has seen a rash of air polluting incidents from the petrochemical industry. We've had the ITC fire, multiple explosions at the ExxonMobil Baytown plant, and most recently, the TPC disaster in Port Neches. So our petrochemical industry, which consists of the infrastructure dedicated to and built by fossil fuel producers, has harmed the health of possibly thousands of people. Um, and we also know that the extreme flooding our region has seen with four 500-year floods in the last five years has been exacerbated by carbon emissions from fossil fuel infrastructure. So I'm here to address the power generation component of carbon emissions. Solar power is clean. It doesn't emit anything. It pays for itself, and it's not subject to price variations the way that, that fossil fuels can be. The cost of solar has come down over 70% in the last decade, and companies and public entities all over the country are realizing that solar power is a smart and cost-saving option. Harris County's population is growing incredibly quickly, and our electricity demand is growing quickly as people move toward electric cars and electric heating systems. So this is the right time when the price is low for us to invest in solar power. Today, I delivered to each of the commissioners and judges office a letter signed by environmental community leaders um, asking for three specific actions. First, to purchase 100% renewable power for county operations through a long-term contract with the developer. You've already chosen to purchase 100% renewable power through credits for the next year, and I appreciate and thank you for that action. The next step is to sign a long-term contract the way that the city of Dallas and Port Houston have recently done. The second action is to develop and publicize a financing option for residential um, buildings. Harris County already has a financing option for commercial and industrial buildings, but a residential option um, could offer homeowners long-term low interest rates for installing solar. The City of Austin has partnered with Velocity Credit Union to do this, and it's greatly increased the rate of rooftop solar growth. The last action is to install solar and battery storage at county buildings, creating energy savings and emergency centers in times of need. Um, the visibility from that will be important and let our residents know that Harris County is taking uh, the energy transition seriously. And adding battery storage will um, generate clean, fume-free power to people during those types of emergency events. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming down. Thank you so much. Mr. Blanche, yeah. you know, we do have two net zero county buildings. Yes. Uh, one of the largest ones in the, in the region is precinct. Good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, there's not a whole lot we can say since this wasn't on the agenda, I but I appreciate your coming. Any other speakers not on the agenda? I am on the agenda. Good afternoon. My name is Julie Duplishan. 
Uh, let me begin by stating that plainly that I understand the members of the Commissioner's Court are a governing body, not management. I also understand that a governing body can add policy concerns to the agenda and bring changes or best practices up for a vote. As such, I request that the issue of approving and assigning an unbiased governing body to oversee HCSO's Harry County's, Harry County, Harris County Sheriff's Office Internal Affairs Department uh, to ensure that citizens' rights, written complaints, et cetera, are honored, be added to the court's agenda. This is a call to action to advocate for every citizen, the disabled person who can't make it here, the senior citizen, and any of the marginalized and disenfranchised. I'm here again to express disappointment in the lack of action from this court in addressing the matter of unethical behavior by Harris County Sheriff's Office Internal Affairs Department employees who deny citizens their First Amendment rights and refuse to accept citizens' written complaints against unethical LEOs without citizens having to jump through unnecessary and inconvenient hoops. I prove this to be the case. Yet when presented with proof that HCSO, Internal Affairs Department, prevented me from filing a complaint against one of their LEOs, the second of two complaints I needed to file, the attorney's office, unfortunately, their employee denied that truth, even though verifiable evidence was provided to them. To be clear, there's no limit on the number of complaints to HCSO, Internal Affairs Department, a citizen can, can uh, submit. There's no limit. So my second complaint should have been accepted. This fact was proven in the paperwork I provided to the court the last time I was here. That person's supervisor did not correct her, but instead mocked me when I shared this information with the court last year, grinning, smiling, and making unnecessary, unnecessary faces as I spoke. It was very unprofessional and very petty. Two times last year I addressed this court, pleading for action to be taken to correct this broken system. Initially, two members seemed interested in helping. When I exposed that the unethical behavior ran deep and needed further discussion and action, perhaps adding the concern to the agenda for consideration and a vote, there was no response. The members passed, sat silently, except the judge. Thank you, ma'am. I voted for you. <laughs> um, the other's actions in passing I found cowardly, disappointing, and to be enabling a broken system. Respectfully, Commissioner Ellis, when I spoke with you at the park, you stated that you didn't want to get involved and would have a staff member call me. That person did not call me. And we all citizens need you to get involved. This is an opportunity for you to truly champion reform, not just send emails saying that you are. Thank you to Penny, who I found out is no longer with Commissioner Garcia's office, for being proactive, responding when I contacted her office. That meant a lot to me, the professionalism, and to Cliff and his staff and Commissioner Cagle's office, because at least I received a response. There was some acknowledgement there. It meant the world to me. I request that one of the commissioners or the judge add my concern to the agenda so that it may be considered at a future meeting. I also ask to be notified when the issue is added to the agenda so that I may contribute. Respectfully, commissioners, you are elected by the people to represent the people, not to sit quietly by while law enforcement abuses their powers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. I contacted your office when his office would not respond and when his staff doesn't respond or they don't have answers. I contacted everyone's office just hoping for a response. And so I just want to tell you thank you. It meant a lot to me that your staff went out of, uh, your staff as well as your staff, I'm sorry, Commissioner Kay, your staff went out of the way. I was told, ma'am, I don't have the answer, but I'll find it for you. With this other office, I can't even, I send emails to Commissioner Ellis and I thank you for the service that you do do, but they don't go to him. Someone streams, someone uh, screens his emails. So when no one responds, I have to come before the court to even say that, sir, I've been trying to contact your office with no response. Thank so I appreciate the professionalism. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else uh, not on the agenda? All right, so it's 325 and Commissioner's Court is now adjourned. Thank you, Happy New Year. Happy New Year.
Thanks.